all for coming today. Um, what do I say? Water is so important. I've read things like we're 98% water. And what happens if our drinking water is no longer safe or if flooding continues to impact us? So this seems like a very environmentally important topic. It's important to our, our shade trees, but it's most important to us personally because our survival really depends on the managing of our work systems. So thank you all for coming and being interested and being willing to be part of the improvements here. Um, I need to tell you all right from the start that we're being televised today. So if, um, if you feel that you want to move and not be in the camera, or if you want to move and be in the camera, please do so. Um, this will be shown on our local Ocean Township cable station, I believe, Tom? Yes. Which is, do you know what channel that is? Cablevision 77, Fires in uh, Zoo. Okay, so if anybody is interested in watching, I know I'm going to give it a watch. We have six panelists to talk to us today about different aspects of work. And they represent all different aspects because water affects us in so many different ways. So we have um, Rutgers, who did a, a, Rutgers did a study of the, I say ground cover, and everyone thinks I'm talking about plants, but Michelle will certainly straighten us out about that. It's about impervious ground covers in our township, their impact on water runoff, and what can be done to improve that. We have the Food and Water Watch, and they're going to talk to us again about the importance of maintaining safe water systems. We have the New Jersey Electric Water Company, who's going to talk to us about what they're doing to keep our water safe. We have Clean Water Action, who will talk to us about how we, as home owners or home dwellers, can improve water quality, improve the water in, in our area on things we do at home. We have a master gardener who will talk to us about rain gardens and how they can impact water. And then finally, we have the Shade Tree Commission, Laurel Van Grafton, who will talk to us about the relationship of trees to water and water safety. So let's get started with Michelle. Bear with me for a minute, please. I'm more organized when I'm home doing this. Uh, Michelle Hartman is a program associated with the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Water Resources Program, where she assists with the design and implementation of green infrastructure products throughout the state. Throughout her experience, Michelle's work <coughs> me, focuses on how design and communication to come together to foster community stewardship and create successfully built projects. Most notably, Michelle led the design and development of a green infrastructure guidance manual for New Jersey, which was designed as a tool for planning and design professionals looking to retrofit green infrastructure practices into existing development. In 2016, this document was awarded the Merit Award in Landscape Architectural Communication by the New Jersey chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And Michelle will talk on the impervious ground for the study results for Ocean Township. Michelle. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming out today. It's a Saturday, but hopefully it will be a nice educational Saturday. Um, so today I'm here to talk about two studies that were done back in the beginning of 2016 to evaluate the impervious cover of Ocean Township, and it was part of a project that included five municipalities within this kind of coastal area of New Jersey in a partnership with the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium and the Whale Palm Brook Watershed Association. So to start, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the cooperative extension and what we do, and then I'll move into kind of an overview of both reports. I have both reports here um, for you guys to take a look at. There's a bound copy on the table over there, and I have one here as well. Um, they're also publicly available online on our website, which is water.rutgers.edu. So if you guys ever want to take a look at them or you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Okay. So the Rutgers um, Cooperative Extension is part of 
the university, it's the outreach arm or the kind of extension arm of the university that deals directly with local communities. So the goal of the organization is to extend the academic research and the academic knowledge from the university to the local communities of New Jersey. Originally, it was started on a agricultural basis, but since then, we've expanded broadly into other programs. The Rutgers Resources Program, uh, the Water Resources Program, which is the program I'm involved with, um, is designed to work statewide, so it's a statewide program as opposed to, we also have county-specific programs, um, to identify and address community water resources issues using sustainable and practical science-based solutions. So that means that basically throughout the state we go around and we identify water quality and water quantity and we do our best to remedy those issues. For the last 13 years, we focused on remedying those issues through the use of green infrastructure um, because we find that it's a great softscape way to help solve localized problems and include the community in that process. So just to give you a little background in case you are not sure or unsure of what impervious cover actually is, um, we pretty much designate impervious cover as anything that does not allow water to pass through it. So that includes any hardscaping like uh, parking lots, roadways, and even rooftops of buildings. Um, their downspouts, in most cases, trail right down into the ground and sometimes directly into the storm system. So what this um, graphic shows is basically on your left-hand side, it is the ideal condition, the condition that we had before New Jersey was developed. 10% of our rainwater would run off the surfaces, but overall most of it would be captured through infiltration and being taken up by plant life. As our development has proceeded, we're now in this darker, gloomier version of today, which is the 55% impervious cover, where uh, more than over 55% impervious cover, where most of our runoff is, most of our stormwater is running off. And that leads to a lot of issues with eroding waterways, um, non-point source pollution, which is people pollution, running directly into our waterways and degrading the quality there. So this is just kind of another illustration of what that looks like. For our state, New Jersey is the most densely populated and the most built out state in the country, um, which leads to this being the majority of the condition that we have to deal with. Even in our suburban areas where it looks pretty, it looks like there's a lot of grass, we still are densely populated and having a majority development, which leads to much less infiltration, more runoff, and overall less um, efficient water quality. So this graph is something we use to kind of make the case for why impervious cover is important to be addressed as an issue. This is the graph from a study that was done by Tom Schuller back in 2008, where he studied basically the effect of impervious cover on overall water quality in the stream. So what this shows is basically from zero to 10%, you're already getting into sensitive water quality issues. From 10 to 25, your streams are designated as impacted. And from 25 to 100, you're looking at completely non-supporting streams. And where this line flattens out, it's basically showing that you lose all ecological value in your stream, in your stream ditch. And so basically, it's just a channel to run water. It could be concrete, more or less, with what it adds to the environment. So as I mentioned, for the last 13 years, we've been focusing on doing our best to remedy these issues through the use of free infrastructure. Green infrastructure is an approach to stormwater management that's cost effective, environmentally friendly, um, and overall sustainable. And we basically have a series of systems, which you'll see on the next slide, that do their best to capture, infiltrate, reuse, or absorb rainwater to the best of their ability. And um, the picture you see on your right is a pervious pavement system, which is also a great storage system. So you can create green infrastructure that is hard or hardscaping, but is porous and allows for you to store stormwater and rainwater during rain events, and then maybe it slowly infiltrates or maybe it just discharges after the peak flow. So this is just kind of a list of what we include is our green infrastructure practices of choice and what we have deemed successful throughout the state thus far. Um, the only one on this list I haven't had personal experience with is green roofs. And mostly that's because 
majority of New Jersey has old development, and those buildings were not built to sustain green roofs, but that doesn't mean it's out of the realm of possibility for new development. So when we look at impervious cover, um, when we assess, make that assessment, um, in both of the reports you'll see that this is kind of the framework that we use to start thinking about what we can do about it. So when we look and evaluate a municipality's impervious cover, we think about ways, how can we eliminate it? So in that way, is there, maybe there's not a parking lot we can get rid of, but maybe there's a blacktop that students are currently playing on as their outdoor activity, and we could make it a green space. And in that way, it can also manage stormwater to some extent. Um, if we can't eliminate it, can we reduce it? Are there less utilized driveways or parking areas that can be converted into a semi-permeable parking area or driveway um, that can help with some water but still have structural integrity to maintain heavy vehicles and whatever? Um, can you eliminate it or reduce it? Or can, if we can't eliminate it or reduce it, can we disconnect it? So in the water resources program lingo, what disconnection means is that if you think about your rooftop and you have water running through a downspout into the ground and that downspout is connected into the ground, it's not flowing onto your grass, we call that connection. What that means is the water has no ability to go onto a soft surface, to get absorbed, to get infiltrated. Instead, it goes right from the impervious surface to the storm drain or eventually to the water body. Um, so disconnection is as simple as taking that downspout out of the ground and letting it flow along the grass and have an opportunity to infiltrate into the ground. Um, but it also can be redirecting that water into a bioretention system or a rain garden, if you'll hear about later. Um, are there impervious surfaces that can harvest rainwater or reuse it? So we've done a number of projects throughout the state that use what's called a cistern system, which is basically a larger rain barrel, if you guys are familiar with what that is. Um, and that allows for basically the use, reuse of water for any non-potable reason. So you can water plants with it. You can wash vehicles with it. Anything that's not drinking it or using it um, for a potable purpose. And then are there conveyance systems that can be converted into bioswales? So a common thing in New Jersey and in a lot of places across the country is we've I think back in the 70s, we started designing um, basins with concrete channels, which basically are just moved to convey water, uh, just designed to convey water. So this is kind of an idea of, okay, can we naturalize those systems? Can we add this absorption and infiltration back into those systems to kind of promote good water health overall? So the, as I mentioned earlier, Rutgers performed two or created two studies um, as part of this project. It was the impervious cover assessment, which we shorthand to the ICA, and the impervious cover reduction action plan, which we shorthand to the RAP, W-A-P, W-R-A-P. Uh, um, and both of those basically assess the impervious cover in your neighborhood, so in Ocean Township, and then the Impervious Cover Reduction Action Plan offers actions to take to remedy these issues or to remedy what has been a challenge for the township overall. So the Impervious Cover Assessment was completed on a watershed and municipality basis. So it evaluates impervious cover from both um, perspectives. It uses land use cover data from 2007 and the volumes that are calculated for overall runoff are basically designed to show you the water quality storm, to, uh, the two year, 10 year, and 100 year design storm. Which basically what you need to know about that is that each of those storms designates a different qual a quantity of water and a likelihood that they'll occur. So the 100 year storm is a much, much grander storm than a two year storm. And then it also contains three preliminary concept designs for sites located in this town. So here we show the land use types for Ocean Township and the way we evaluate land use in um, the sense of impervious cover is we believe that anything that is urban is impervious for best case scenario. So we've evaluated that on a pie chart scale and we've basically come to the conclusion that 75% of Ocean Township is impervious. So as we saw in Tom Schuller's study, anything above 50, 25, um, anything above 25 was a non-supporting 
stream system. So this basically plays the case that something needs to be done. We're not sure what yet, but something needs to be done to remedy this issue. And in the same accord, we kind of look at what the overall um, breakdown is for uh, land use and residential um, to understand kind of what the opportunity is. In the case of Ocean Township, a lot of the area is medium density residential, so what that means for smaller programming and other outreach efforts that directly influence the homeowners. And this is kind of just a breakdown of the sub-watersheds within your municipality. This is just to show that you have a, you're influencing a lot of water bodies. So it's not just the problem within the bounds of the municipality, it's a problem that's starting in Ocean Township and affecting communities downstream. These are just the overall impervious cover. Um, this is like a summary table that shows you how much impervious cover falls into each subwatershed. And what this does is this, perf this is kind of the initial start to working with other municipalities in the Whale Pond Brook like we did um, as part of this project to say, okay, Ocean Township contributes 23% of this impervious cover, but maybe Eaton Town contributes 50%. So how can we get those towns together to kind of work on this project holistically? And this, as mentioned previously, is that breakdown of rainfall events. So basically what this is showing is that in each of these sub-watersheds, this many million gallons are being Run, are running off your impervious surfaces for each storm. So a lot. It's basically what you need to take from this. Um, and this is not uncommon for any municipality within the state. I work in Perth Amboy as my other half um, of my job here at the Rutgers Water Resources Program, and their conditions are significantly worse. And they have a combined sewer system, which has got a whole other list of problems. So. Um, Ocean Township is not new to this. This is a problem that tracks across the entire state, unfortunately. So when we evaluate sites, what you'll see in the um, impervious cover reduction action plan is we look to engage the public first. That's kind of our, our line of defense. That's our first priority because we take on the opinion that if we engage the public in this, we shift a perception of what green infrastructure means across the state and we get these projects that are both environmentally friendly and cost effective ingrained into kind of the idea of how to solve this problem. And we step away from pipes and other hardscaping solutions and we move towards a more eco-friendly, cost effective solution. So in that case, we have a look here first list. So when we evaluate sites for green infrastructure, we first look at schools, churches, libraries, municipal buildings, public works, firehouses, post offices, Elks or moose lodges and parks and recreational fields. And the reason for that is because they're highly visible, they have great opportunities for partnership, and they usually have a great deal of impervious cover, with the exception of parks and recreational fields. So these are the one of three concepts that are shown in the back of the impervious cover assessment report, which is the ICA report. And what these do is they give a preliminary graphic of what um, where green infrastructure can be included, which we are, here we have three different systems shown. Um, it gives you a brief description of what it looks like. Um, these are graphics that were produced just as kind of an example for people. It gives a series of site photos and a brief description of what we're talking about. So these are kind of just preliminary things to get your mind moving, and get you thinking about how this can, can change your town. And this is the same thing for the um, firehouse and for the library. So at the library, we um, have uh, offered a series of in, uh, rain garden or bioretention systems, downspout planters, and rainwater harvesting. So these are just basically for, off of our first assessment of what the property looks like and the impervious cover it has on it, what can be an option? And then the goal would be to meet with somebody that has control over the development on this property and see what can be done to engage the public and install a project. 
So the impervious cover reduction action plan is kind of an extension or a complementary component to this initial assessment of the impervious cover within your municipality. And what it does is it selects a series of um, sites within your municipality and in addition to that breaks it up by subwatershed. So if you do come into contact with another um, town with a partnership with one of the, like the Whale Pond Brook, like we did, the Whale Pond Brook Watershed Association loves the fact that we did this assessment for the whole town, but is really interested in these sites, what falls within their subwatershed, because that's their mission, that's their goal. And each of the site um, assessments includes a brief description of what is suggested or recommended for the site, site photos, location, and site area. And it, the biggest thing is that it actually includes the recommendations and what they would do if implemented. So how they would recharge, how they would remove TXS, um, what their volume uh, reduction potential is, and even an estimated cost. Um, the one thing we do like to mention as a disclaimer is the estimated cost is materials only, so it does not include if you have a contractor build it. But the idea behind this plan is to start the process of creating a stormwater mitigation plan. So this is a great avenue to be adopted as if there's new development and the um, contractor can't um, do anything about the stormwater on site, they can select one of these sites and implement something there. And then again, much like the concepts, they all have a site plan with the designated areas that we recommend um, the uh, green infrastructure be implemented and the drainage area is listed in blue. And then as part of this project, kind of to tack on the end to make it a little bit easier for residents like yourself to access this information, in addition to the physical report, which you can read cover to cover if you'd like, um, we also have a web map that's available online where you can, if you find a site that you're very familiar with, like the library, um, you can click on it and just see the recommendations for that site. So it's a great um, tool to be used for somebody who has, say, a grant to um, do a project at a certain site, but they don't know what to do. This is kind of their first um, conversation into that, into that um, space. So just some final thoughts. Basically, these two uh, reports were created to promote action, and they're a great conduit and avenue for looking for funding. These projects have already been identified, and they've already had initial recommendations. Um, in addition to that, the impervious cover reduction plan provides sites for developers to offset impacts. Oh, no. Okay, that might be because this is my last slide. Um, in addition, they are, there's a wide range of projects. So we've, in the past, we actually just did this in Long Branch, um, had the opportunity to work with a Girl Scout on her Gold Award project. And as part of the Whale Pond Group project, we um, were able to partner with her, give her recommendations, provide des technical designs for her to gather up all the materials and build the thing herself. And she did a fantastic job. She basically found all the materials um, that were donated to her and I went out there to make sure everything was running smoothly and she had people helping her um, and it's a really successful project and that's at the Covenant Church in Long Branch. Um, and then in addition to that, we can think further ahead into planning, um, thinking about stormwater utilities, watershed restoration plans, as I mentioned, stormwater mitigation plans, and other integrated water quality plans. So this is kind of something we leave everyone with, um, whether you're a resident or you're a municipality administration. Um, it's just the thought to think about how we move forward from here. So um, we've created these plans, as I mentioned to someone earlier, and we're um, we've created these plans for a number of towns and we're trying to continue to create them for every town throughout the state because we find that they're useful and they're the first step to action. So after we talk to someone about how great green infrastructure is and they're so excited about it, this is kind of the first thing to say, okay, look what you can do. And we've laid all this out for you. 
And in some cases, you can form a municipal action team, which is something we've done now in Newark, Camden, um, Trenton, and Perth Amboy, which is the first step to getting residents and community members involved in kind of taking ownership of these plans and projects moving forward. Okay. Yes? You listed the library, the church, the firehouse, and so forth. Have those uh, entities been a part of what you have done already, or? So what we've done with this project thus far is we've presented this presentation to the Environmental Commission um, because we think it's really important to get um, local buy-in on the report as opposed to going right to the property owner. So we would much rather get the buy-in from the Environmental Commission and have the Environmental Commission be educated and well enough to go to the firehouse and say, we really want this to happen, are you interested? Um, because we find that's much more successful and they have a better um, way of communicating with people they know the face of. Yes? Would you be willing to come back and do the same presentation at a town council meeting where uh, our mayor and council members are there? I mean, I think I actually learned of this meeting through them, and I'm quite surprised that one of them are here today. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> I'm really, uh, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. So New Jersey, as a state nationally, is in the worst situation. We're the most heavily, um, we're the most densely populated, and in an event, we're the most developed. So. The, the transit of property leads that to the most impervious cover in most cases. And the difficult situation New Jersey has as opposed to a lot of West Coast states is that we have to retrofit everything because our development is so far along and we've been here for so long and we've developed systems in such a way that now we have to go back and that's a whole different kind of conversation than new development. New development can integrate these systems in a very innovative way from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But kind of going tracking back is an interesting is an interesting um, site challenge. So and, and then you said 50, it looks like from the graph, fifty five percent of Ocean Township is densely is developed. Uh, yeah, versus open space or seventy five. Right, that's frightening. You know, I just attended the. I'm sorry. I just attended the first um, Shady Tree Commission Environmental Council meeting this mm -hmm. week, and learned it came up that we're very close to being now ur an urban community. We're no longer a suburban community. Are, is that are we technically urban now? Um, I would say. I mean, if you want to look at it statewide, most of the state is urban because. Suburban is urban, that's why it's suburban, you know, and we've gotten so densely populated in a lot of our suburban areas that um, most of it, especially on the east side of the state, where we're closer to the city, um, is classified as urban. I don't understand how you can say it's urban when, you know, the built uh, the elements on a plot of land in suburbia are a lot fewer than in a city. True. Uh, but the the scope of urban in this context, when you look at, it's all, it's somewhat subjective in the fact that suburban in the state of New Jersey is much better than the urban areas in the state of New Jersey. But if you look in the Midwest, you know, we still have a significantly more development are significantly more densely populated than Oklahoma. So when you look at the urban scale, you have to figure out what you're looking at. If you're looking at the state, yes. Suburban communities have a lot better situation than the urban communities like Perth Amboy or Newark because they're dealing with not only dense population and a slew of impervious cover, but then a different sewer system that where their risks are a lot higher because in the urban communities like Newark, Perth Amboy, and Camden, they have a combined sewer system, which basically means that your sewer water and your storm water are going into the same pipe. And if that pipe gets overloaded, it directly dis discharges to the local waterway untreated, which means that you're, you have wastewater going into local waterways if not treated appropriately. So, I mean, but really, the idea of suburb, suburb is that there's land on your property that's pervious, whereas it's not true <coughs> in the urban setting. Um, that's true, but the... If, you look at what is pervious, it's still turf grass, which has an absorption rate of about two inches before it becomes essentially impervious. 
so even less than that. So it takes like the first three quarters of an inch before it has reached its capacity and is super saturated and everything else is more or less running off. If all of those open spaces were heavy duty metal grasses, then your infiltration and your absorption would be a lot higher. But because it's turf grass, that's where we really run into the issue of calling this urban, where originally it was suburban. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Based on what you just said, how can you make a parking lot non -per uh, uh, pervious? Do you see what I'm you know, yes. talking about? You're going to make a parking lot better than a, a, a plot of grass? Well, no, but I think the alternative is that a parking lot, a previous parking lot, offers a solution to maintain your parking, but also add the potential for groundwater recharge. So you're working on small percentages on that urban Absolutely. percentage. We're, we're talking percentages. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be classified as urban. You're okay. not going to reduce that 75% urban. It's the effect of urban and then you look at those percentages. Exactly. Yes. It's hard to prove that you did something. <laughs> I just want to be very clear about this because if we do take action and ask the town to take action, we're asking the town and the people to inconvenience themselves making these changes. So what happens if we don't and we leave everything impervious this water is running off into our streams now and does it endanger our drinking water does it make us more vulnerable the storms that we had this summer i just tell my breath and it's not over yet mm -hmm. that we could still be hit by a maria or a whatever the one I, I don't even remember all the names that hit florida um could you just maybe briefly explain like is why it, would it be better to get rid of this impervious cover? Does that help protect us? So the idea with, we're talking about two kind of separate things. So when we talk about resilience, which I'm sure all of you have heard in the wake of Sandy and all these other storms, we talk about coastal resilience and protecting the coastline, but also protecting the back flood. And everywhere in this town that it floods, things are only gonna get worse. And the point is, that implementing green infrastructure offers another place, however small it is, for water to go in as opposed to run across or to sit. And for, I can speak most directly to a project I just did in Perth Amboy that was constructed this summer. They had a huge flooding issue. I'm talking six inches of water that sat in the middle of the road because the drains were clogged or overfilled and the water just had nowhere to go. It sat on the roadway to the point where the woman who lived across the street had to put sandbags in front of her driveway to prevent it from getting into her house. So what we did was we implemented a three-part strategy in the park across the street. The park was limited impervious cover, it had a parking lot, but it was a ball field and a playground, so turf grass, and that was it. So it did limited work to actually capture the water and hold it back, and it actually added additional runoff because um, after that first three quarters of rain, it became a parking lot, more or less. Um, so we implemented a 1,000 foot square foot rain garden, a porous asphalt system, and a three-celled biosoil system. And since then, it's only rained, what, Tuesday or Monday of last week? Um, we've seen significant decreases in the amount of water that sits in front of that woman's house. So it's small, but it's site specific. And that's kind of the conversation that we try to have directly with communities. Because yes, on a large scale and a planning perspective, this would be great, but it's the new development that's, that's gonna work for it. Because we have a built out situation where the small scale stuff is really gonna take us to the place we need to be in, in community places. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very brief because we do need to okay. keep our track with so. I'm looking at the 7.9% forest. We have, I'm not sure if you're aware, but just outside the library, we have 32 acres of historic, it's actually Native American historic land. It has not been touched. It's, it's just gorgeous inside. Very old trees that have remained there for hundreds of years. It's under threat right now of development um, for a, a mega commercial development, a giant Wawa gas station with lots of pumps, like 25 pumps. 
um, a Marriott hotel, a Chick-fil-A fast food restaurant, an LA fitness center, 71 um, townhouses, and lots of blacktop, I mean ridiculous. And it's really the only plot of land that we have that's undeveloped. Mm -hmm. And it's, if we're in such a serious situation, what would be your recommendation that the town, we're trying now, we have, a, we have a, a referendum on the ballot right now to vote for um, open space referendum. Uh, so the township could perhaps gain this funding to buy a parcel of that 32 acres and preserve it for our environment. Mm -hmm. Or it's looking at the rateables of what tax dollars come in. That's it. So is there any way to police something like that from the state? Um, I mean, I don't know from the state level, and I don't know, it depends how far along the process is, but what a lot, have, a lot of townships have done is modify their ordinance. So at a minimum, if something like that is going to happen and the city decides very, very unfortunately that, that the rateables of that is more beneficial than this asset that, this, that the community has, at, at minimum, you can re kind of structure your ordinance to say, okay, if you're going to create all of this impervious surface, this is our problem, so you need to at least do your best on site to remedy that issue. So any development you have, you need to capture all that stormwater runoff in whatever way that you can. And if you can't do it on site, you have to make, take these sites from this report and go fix them. Because we can't afford to lose what that forest does for stormwater. Right. So since we're losing that, you have to do this to fix it. And Papa Brook runs right through that. Really exactly. So that's, that's a very important yeah, question to have. If you have any more questions, I, I think Michelle has already said, feel free to contact Absolutely. Us. Michelle also is uh, double engaged today and is running from here to her next engagement. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. Do we have your email? Yes, I'm, I can leave cards up there. I have a few. And then I have the reports are over there. I also left these. This is, I, um, Mary talked to briefly about the uh, manual that was put together. Uh, this is kind of the abridged community version of the manual, so it goes through each practice, um, it, the overall conditions in New Jersey, each practice with a case study in New Jersey, um, just to give you a brief overview of what we've had experience working with. And then the this, as well as the manual and the reports, are all available on our website, which is water.ruckers.edu. Great. So Thank these you. are just to look at because we have one copy of each and that is to take and then if you want to get this, you go online for it. Okay. Okay? Thanks. Thank you again. Thanks, Michelle. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lena Smith from the Food and Water Watch. And Lena is going to talk to us about the need for well-funded, well-controlled water systems to protect from flooding and maintain safe drinking water. Tell you a little bit about Lena while she's prepared. Uh, Lena is a New Jersey organizer for Food and Water Watch. She is responsible for outreach to South Jersey community groups and organizations that work to act on climate change and keep water publicly owned. Most recently, Lena worked with the community of Atlantic City to ensure that voters' rights are protected in any sale of the water system. Are you ready? No. Okay. Um, good morning. Thank you all. My name is Lena. I am a regional organizer for Food and Water Watch, and I'll tell you about who we are in a minute, but I'm going to talk with you this morning about the need for public funding for our drinking water infrastructure and how that can help protect water for all. Um, I think we've all seen the headlines about the state of our water and um, the crisis that it's put us in that we are seeing in Flint that there, people are um, have Legionnaire's disease, lead poisoning, so it's a big issue even in New Jersey. I think we've some of us have seen the headlines about lead in water. Food and Water Watch, we champion healthy food and clean water. We stand up to corporations that put profits over people and advocate for a democracy that improves people's lives and protects our environment. Uh, we use a mixture of research, policy, um, uh, advocacy materials, strategic planning, and organizing to advocate for publicly controlled water. 
and um, we, we don't take any corporate or government funding, which allows us to take non-compromising positions on the issues we work on. We have 17 offices around the country and, um, and the world, including our Food and Water Europe office, South America. Uh, we have a legal arm, Food and Water Justice, and Food and Water Action Fund, which is a political advocacy arm. So we are a political advocacy organization, and I'm going to talk with you today about some of the policies that have led to some of, to the place we're in with our drinking water infrastructure. <coughs> So just an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, go over the background, some of the major problems we're facing, some solutions that um, are out there, uh, and um, the, what we're working on to protect public drinking water. So um, without water, there is no life. 60% of the human body is made up of water. We're able, it keeps our body temperatures regulated, it lubricates our joints so we're able to be more active, uh, it protects sensitive tissues in our body, uh, and it helps us get rid of unwanted waste through perspiration, through urination and bowel movements. There are a lot of uses for water besides drinking water. Um, so you know, people use them in spiritual, practices, religious ceremonies for recreation and tourism, for basic sanitation, showering, bathing, flushing the toilet, washing our clothes, for watering domestic crops, for our agriculture production, um, for manufacturing clothes, electronics, paper, uh, for extracting fossil fuels. It's used in the process to extract um, natural gas and oil. It's, we're able to ship goods across the country, between countries. It provides environmental services like the ones that we talked about before. And, um, you know, it's very significant for a lot of religions around the world. So just a brief history for sort of that um, in 1968 we saw, um, I mean, you know, this, was, this is kind of the timeline of pollution that this water quality has declined. Uh, there was pollution in the Chesapeake Bay, which resulted in $3 million in losses to the fishing industry. In 1969, the Hudson River bacterial level was identified to be 170 times over the safe limit. Uh, we saw rivers bursting into flames, and, and that our drinking, water, our drinking water, the level of contamination was 30% of the samples were contaminated. And so in 1972, it was identified that two-thirds of the country's lakes, rivers, and coastal waters were unsafe for fishing or swimming. And that led to the passage of the Clean Water Act. And the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972 to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water. Uh, the goal is that there's zero discharge to waterways by 1985. It created the Construction Grants Program to be able to fund publicly owned wastewater treatment plants. And um, there were amendments in 1987 that replaced the grant program and with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And this allows, provides communities with low cost financing for wastewater and stormwater projects. So this is the Safe Drinking Water Act, which was the amendment. And it allows the EPA to set standards and regulate the contaminants in drinking water. It applies to every public water system and in 1996, there were amendments passed that created the Safe Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. This provides communities with low-cost financing for drinking water project. Every state has a state revolving fund. It's what New Jersey uses to, or what municipalities use to, they can draw funds from to repair their drinking water infrastructure. So then if we have all these funding sources, what's the problem? Why, what are, what are we being faced with? And that you know, there's crumbling infrastructure. That uh, since 1977, we've seen a drop in uh, by 74 percent of federally funded drinking water infrastructure systems, and this results in a significant risk to our public and environmental health. And um, so, for beaches that are regularly monitored, the EPA estimates that about 3,500 to 5,500 gastrointestinal illnesses per year are caused by combined sewage overflows, which was discussed in the previous presentation. This data is available for only coastal and Great Lakes beaches, 
but the EPA cannot calculate a national estimate of the human impact of these combined sewage overflows because sufficient water and quality and health effects data are not available for recreational and swimming um, areas in the United States. And so we're seeing that with this, these cuts in funding to our drinking water infrastructure, that the water infrastructure is failing. Uh, and without the fed dedicated federal funds, the cost of upgrading our water infrastructure will fall on ratepayers to make and making water unaffordable for many. So over, we see on average 240,000 water main breaks a year, and that results in 1.7 trillion gallons of water lost to water main breaks. 75,000 sewer overflows, that means it's spilling three to 10 billion gallons of sewage into our drinking, into our waterways a year. Um, where it results in sinkholes, and it's back to the local economy. So just an example where toxic algae in Toledo, Ohio, in 2014, almost 500,000 people were without water for three days, and many local businesses and restaurants were closed, um, impacting the local economy. And we're seeing that many households can't afford to pay their water bills, <coughs> and that there's, there's a growing water affordability crisis and water shutoffs happening around the United States. So in Detroit, we saw this happening, and we're also seeing it in Baltimore, where as of 2014, an estimated 12% of households in the United States can't afford their water service. And by 2019, we'll see that nearly 36% of U.S. households will be unable to afford their water bills. And water affordability is defined, there's a, um, the United Nations sets a, a percentage of what, what it means for water to be affordable based on your income levels. And so that's how we define water affordability. And, and then we have the lead in, lead in water crisis, which I think really in the last year or two we, has really peaked in at least awareness of the issue. And over 6 million line, lead service lines deliver water to millions of people. So, um, and roughly 11,200 community water systems have lead lines, and that includes schools. And there's a failure to replace the entire lead service line, so even a portion on a homeowner's property from the, the main line to the home is, is resulting in increased lead levels in water. So, you know, I think you know, we saw in Flint high levels of lead, but we also are hearing in Newark and Camden school systems that there's high levels of lead in the water. And the health impacts, um, no level of lead is safe. Um, and it impacts people of all ages, but especially children under the age of six. And uh, these are some of the signs and symptoms of lead poisoning. Developmental delays, learning difficulties, loss of appetite. Um, <coughs> to identify lead in, in, in a person's blood, you have to take a blood test to identify lead poisoning. Blood levels diminish after 30 days, but the impacts are irreversible. And then just basic, basically overall, there's a lack of infrastructure for our drinking water. So there are communities, small, tri small and rural communities, tribal communities that don't have the infrastructure to properly treat and deliver water. Uh, rural households that don't have the capacity to install or improve their septic systems and contaminated rural household drinking water wells. So even the individual um, household septic systems are failing. More than one in five American households uh, have septic systems and the source of 50% failure rate is um, 17 years old, so the source for the one in five households is even older. Um, the census stopped tracking septic system info because there's no federal agency that regulates septic systems. Uh, so a lot of the septic systems for individual households need to be upgraded. And that can result in environmental damage. So according to the Natural, Natural Resource Defense Council, uh, Beach report in 2013, 10% of all monitoring sam samples uh, exceed the, the EPA's beach action value. 
and the major contributors for beach closures include agriculture runoff, failure, se failing septic systems, and combined sewer overflows. Uh, and this shows the lack of federal support for our drinking water systems. Uh, so in 1977, we spent on average 76 dollars on per person for drinking water infrastructure and, to, and in 2014 we saw that um, only 13 dollars was being spent per person and the epa recommends that the u.s should be spending 35 billion dollars for safe drinking water infrastructure and um, for an example flint had the most expensive uh, water service in the country they had the highest water rates in the country and um, what happened was there was a loss of democratic control over the city of Flint. There, were, there was an emergency manager who was in charge, uh, who was appointed by the governor, who was in charge of the, the decisions around the drinking water system. And he hiked up the water rates and shifted the water funds to the city's general fund. So the money that was available to fix the drinking water system went into a general fund for the city. And, and then, um, and then they sold the water line that was connecting uh, Flint's water to Detroit and started taking water from the polluted Flint River, which um, it was very corrosive water. It leached lead into the water and poisoned the children there, leading to a deadly Legionnaire's disease. And in that instance, money was put over people's, people's lives and health and safety. And um, one of the results of this is that we're seeing an increase in water privatization over the, over, across the country. Um, but this, uh, this is a false solution for, for our drinking water systems. Um, that when a municipality uh, sells the system, the water that, it, or, excuse me, the money that is paid will, is, has to be recovered in funds, in um, rate, rate increases. And, and public financing, or excuse me, private financing is one and a half to two and a half times higher than public financing. So the, any infra infrastructure upgrades uh, means that rate payers are paying the cost of the infrastructure upgrades. Uh, it leads to loss of public control. You're, right, uh, under a publicly owned system, you're able to control your water system through, a, through the ballot box, through your elected officials, through a referendum. Um, and you're able to control the rate hikes more, more directly rather than through the BPU. Um, we see that water privatization results in job loss and poor customer service. So um, private water companies downsize water systems, regionalizing service management, and there's, less, uh, there's a lower response time to address the infrastructure repairs needed, um, resulting in uh, environmental risks. Here's a look at New Jersey's water bill comparison for publicly run systems versus privately run systems. So in New Jersey, on average, privately owned systems charge 79% more than publicly owned systems. That's about $230 each year that you're paying for privately owned water. And this is a look at where we're at nationwide, at some of the other states around the country. And this is a look at uh, municipalities that have ended privatization and actually saved money in doing so. So um, this, these are, um, this is the column, the savings anticipated or realized under a publicly owned system, whether it be from 12% or as high as 36% of even 50% in Gary, Indiana, but it depends on the size of the system. And we're seeing, and Food and Water Watch recently put out a report on the state of public water in the United States, which I've left on the back table, and we're seeing that there's actually a trend to remunicipalize water systems that um, between 20, 2017, 2007 to 2014, we saw a 10% increase in publicly owned systems and an 18% decline in private systems. And the difference between the two tables um, <coughs> The is based on this is a people serve so how many people system 
are actually being served by private water and public water, and this is the number of systems. The systems are different sizes. So how do we fix our infrastructure problem? This is the work that Food and Water Watch is doing. We need our elected officials to make water infrastructure a priority again. And Food and Water Watch, we believe that through grassroots organizing, we need to demand safe water for our communities. And so we use a grassroots organizing model to, to build public support for public, publicly owned drinking water systems. We're working to pass the Water Act. And uh, this was introduced in Congress by Representative Conyers. It would create, uh, it would make uh, $35 billion in de dedicated funding annually for our drinking water systems. It provides dedicated funding to, to go into that state revolving fund that I talked about earlier. It creates a school drinking water improvement grant program so that um, there's money going to our schools to be able to repair the lead in the school um, in the school infrastructure. It's uh, supporting public utilities, and it, and there are grants available for homes, homeowners, and communities to remove the lead lines. So water stands for. Uh, water affordability, transparency, equity, and reliability. And I've also left a fact sheet on the back table about it, but I'm gonna go over. So what it does, the Water Act will create 700,000 to 90, 945,000 jobs. So the jobs will come from trucking, from road work that's needed to, to, in, to put in new infrastructure, the plumbers, the pipe fitters, the welders, and the other sectors throughout the economy that will see a boost in, in economic generation from, from infrastructure repairs. It will require that the US, that it uses US made iron and steel for water infrastructure products, so we're using US made product to improve our systems, and encourages union jobs that require workers earn a prevailing wage, so to protect workers. Um, like I said, there. We're working, you know, this is the key concern is getting lead out of the water. So the school drinking water improvement grant program will provide schools with funds to test, repair, replace, or install the infrastructure for water fountains and water bottle filling stations. Um, so that would be able to provide, it's a grant program. Meaning that when, when we say grants, it means that municipality, or that you don't have to pay the money back, it's not a loan, which is often an inhibitor for municipalities to improve their systems. And we're working to make water service affordable. It will require that the EPA study water affordability nationwide and include water rates, shutoffs, and the effectiveness of the state revolving fund for promoting affordable and equitable service. It will remove the full burden of the cost of infrastructure upgrades from ratepayers. So instead of the cost of infrastructure needing to be paid by ratepayers, it will um, allow for funding to be available. And being able to access, increase access to drinking water and sewer systems in areas that don't have a, a drinking water system. So in rural and tribal communities across the country, it'll create grants that are available for residents to increase, to improve their septic tanks. Um, that, and it will so, um, specifically support disadvantaged communities and safe water for Native American communities. So these are some of the organizations around the country that, that are supporting the Water Act. Oh, wow, that was interesting. Um, and we need you to help us. So here are some ways that you can get involved. Um, we use a text system. If you text water for all to 69866 uh, by writing a letter to the editor, to, to your local paper, to talk about the need for federal investment in our, for public investment in our drinking water systems, through working with your mayor and city council to pass a resolution supporting the Water Act, um, Food and Water Watch, uh, attend a Food and Water Watch meeting. Um, we don't have any coming up. Uh, or hosting house parties and Food and Water Watch staff and organizers can come to a house party to educate people about the need for for um, drinking water, to, for funding for drinking water infrastructure. 
That's it. Um, that's just gonna, yeah. Yeah. I've heard on the news that there are uh, on uh, there are new uh, cancer causing <coughs> chemicals or mm -hmm. elements in the water that are not being currently tested for. Uh, and do you know anything about that? I, I can't speak specifically to each and every chemical, but yeah, there are different regulations for different chemicals, and the DEP, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection identifies help is you know supposed to identify what those chemicals are and help to test for them um, but Amy I, I could give a little information yeah. on that um, the at the national level they test for 82 or 84 chemicals um, New Jersey tests for 92 or 94 and I'm mm -hmm. not quite exactly right uh, we also have slightly higher standards for certain things um, here in New Jersey, and uh, we also have a private well testing act that requires testing and disclosure of the sale or rental of, of properties. Um, there are 680 known contaminants in water, but they don't have standards for them. And uh, there is a lot of work being done around unregulated contaminants, whether it's pharmaceuticals and other things that are found in the water. Some water utilities are being a little bit more aggressive about trying to do some treatment to, to reduce exposure even if they don't have a standard, but um, it's not uniform across the board and systems can be as small as a trailer park, so the operating uh, water system, um, to, you know, a New Jersey American, you know, which is a large um, uh, Farm-owned system that operates, but does good, you know, does larger system work and has more resources available to it and, and tends to be a little bit more proactive. So it really depends. Yeah, uh, but there's very few chemicals that we test for. Just a quick clarification: we're not farm owned. We're, we're U.S. owned. Okay. Other questions? Do you wear Okay, that's <laughs> Yeah. Do you know anything about New Jersey's situation with the lead lenders? Is that but it's not, not a comprehensive situation about what they're doing? There was a task force created at the legislature to look at what's happening and to address the, the water infrastructure needs of New Jersey, but not at a comprehensive level. Yeah. How could we how should we organize someone to come and test our water here in Ocean Township? Um, I think you can talk with your water utility provider. Um, yeah. It wouldn't go through our town council. We would, go, we would just go directly to provide our water provider and tell them we are request a test. Um, well, like, the water company sends out every uh, year the status and the safety and the tests that are done. So. Right, yeah, not, uh, that, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. After lunch, I think you're going to hear more specifically <laughs> about your water utility and how they're treating it and what they're doing to make sure that it's <coughs> safe. Other questions? Okay. I just, uh, my contact information is the final slide if you want to write it down. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, thank you all. Sandwiches, cookies, and food out here, as well as the equipment. So, grab a plate and help yourself. And then sit back there because there's four more speakers to go. Good evening. Uh, what I will probably do, if it's all right for all the presenters to come, I'll put the cookies and the fruit up over here, and that way. If you feel like it, you can just help yourselves while they're talking. Is that okay yeah. with you all? Sure. Okay. Um, and our next presenter is going to be Ryan Euro. Put on my glasses on the other one correctly. He's a PE superintendent of operations and production for New Jersey American Water. And he is going to give us a brief introduction to the New Jersey American Water Company. Um, Okay, Brian has worked for 
New Jersey American for 10 years. He oversees operations at the company's production facilities throughout Monmouth County. So that's us. That's us. <laughs> 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 um, he has spent his entire career working in the drinking water industry. He has been with the well, I said that already. He's a graduate of Bucknell University with a degree in civil engineering. Brian is also a licensed professional engineer in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. He is also a certified New Jersey systems operator with a W-2 and C-2 license. And if you want to know what those are, you can ask Brian. <laughs> w, W-2 is our is distribution, and um, C is software collections. Yep. Right, the expert in software collections right there. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, she, she introduced me already, and I'm, I'm just going to go through, um, I'm not going to take the whole time because I sense that there's a private questions, so I, and I uh, be uh, respectful of your time and the fact that it's a beautiful Saturday, but uh, I don't want to have anybody up, so I'll keep uh, the presentation fairly uh, brief. But also feel free to interrupt me during it and ask questions if you have something, you know, and then I'll we'll also have time at the end for questions uh, if I didn't uh, cover something you were thinking about. Um, and tying back into some of the earlier presentations, um, especially the Food and Water Watch one, I saw a couple of times, like their signs talk about water for life. Uh, American Water, which is the parent of New Jersey American Water, um, our, our logo, um, our vision is clean water for life, which um, ties back into that. I mean, it, it really is, you, you can't live without it, uh, as Lena was saying earlier, and, and, and not just water, but having, having access to clean water is so, so vital uh, for us. Uh, just a, a little overview first on, on New Jersey American water as a whole, and then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about our local operations here. Um, we serve, you know, New Jersey American Water serves uh, about a third of New Jersey's residents. Um, New Jersey American Water is a subsidiary of American Water, uh, which operates uh, water systems across the country, and uh, water and wastewater. And um, we were uh, uh, privately owned by RWE, which was a, um, a utility company from Germany. Uh, prior to that, we were um, uh, a publicly traded company, and in 2008, um, we went uh, back to a publicly traded company. Uh, our, our stock is on the um, uh, stock exchange, and um, it's it's an American-based company. Uh, the headquarters is in Voorhees, New Jersey, um, and our local headquarters uh, for the coastal region is in Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury Avenue, uh, next to uh, the Jeep dealer. Uh, right down from Circle Circle Hyundai. Um, so in New Jersey, we have about 800 employees, give or take, uh, in the state. Uh, we serve a little more than 2.7 million people uh, in 191 communities, approximately. The number kind of fluctuates, um, and in 18 counties. Uh, and our customer base, uh, we have about 631,000 water accounts. Um, and about 46,000 uh, sewer accounts. Uh, our sewer operations are mostly um, based out of uh, Lakewood. Uh, we have the, the uh, Lakewood sewer system there. Down in our uh, uh, Atlantic uh, Fire Road operation area, that, <coughs> that sewer. And also uh, Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, and then we have some smaller uh, like state state sewer system, like little pocket systems, but our large our large um, sewer systems are those. Um, and on our water accounts, we're about about 93, 94 percent residential and about seven percent uh, commercial industrial. Um, and our customer service uh, side, uh, we have online. That's our um, state website, NewJerseyAMWater.com. Uh, go online, do bills. Uh, there's also, even if you're not a, a, a customer, there's a ton of information on there. That's where the uh, water quality reports are. Also, all of our outreach information. We have a program uh, with 
uh, part of this scholastic that does um, uh, like educational programs for schools at, at the elementary level. And uh, all that information is on our website. Um, and then we also have phone. Uh, it's 24-7 for emergencies, and then also Monday through Friday, 7 to 7, for just routine routine issues, bill, bill questions, um, start and stop service. Uh, in addition, we also, in the Lakewood office, and in the Hazlitt office, in the Shorelands uh, system, we also have, um, you can go in, customers can go in, um, and if you need to apply for a new service or have a question about your service, we have a new services uh, group in Lakewood, and we have a full customer service group. Um, um, uh, two nice folks up there in the, in the Hazlitt office, which is at 1709 Union Avenue in uh, Hazlitt. And... Let's talk about the map. On the green areas, those are the ones that you serve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go back. I'll show that. Um, Yep, uh, these areas here roughly are our service areas um, in, in blue there, yep. And uh, so where, where, does, where, does your, where does the water come from um, throughout our system? Again, I'll, I'll, this is like statewide and we'll also then focus in just on, on the, the coastal north system that, that we're in. Um, across the state, about 72% of our water is surface water uh, coming from either reservoirs or rivers. Um, 23% from groundwater, from wells that we have, and about 5% is purchased. Uh, so uh, from either other utilities or from uh, like the uh, New Jersey Water Supply um, entity. And uh, throughout the state, we have about, I'll say seven main primary plants, uh, and they treat, uh, combine about 350 million gallons of water a day. Uh, they, have that, they have that capability. And we have about 247 wells, that's another 110 million. And uh, we have five reservoirs, main reservoirs throughout the state uh, that, that hold about 6 billion gallons of, of water. So uh, tying back to some of the earlier things on, on um, like the, like way we back in the day when, when pollution was so bad that the rivers would be on fire like this is, is very near and dear to our heart because that's, this is, this is where our, our water comes from, and, and we um, we are really intent on on making sure that that is that that is kept um, pristine. Uh, we have about 158 water tanks and about 121 booster stations, so we have a fair amount of facilities in uh, in in New Jersey. The uh, reservoirs, you don't own those reservoirs, do you? Or? Uh, it's a mix. Some of them we do. We we own uh, like locally. We own the Glendora Reservoir. <coughs> And we own the Swimming River Reservoir. Um, we do not own the uh, the Mendes Swan one. And the wells? Um, the wells as well? Uh, yeah, we, most of those wells we do own. Yeah. What are the purchases for the today? Uh, most of them we, we drill ourselves um, over over time. So, water in one, let's, let's say this spot here mm -hmm. is larger. Does, that, does the water it receives come from one spot, or do you mix water? Good question. And about two slides. <laughs> you see the, uh, the answer. You see the answer to that. Uh, and again, leading into um, so water quality. This uh, photos from our, our uh, lab down in in South Jersey. Um, I mean, like, like I mentioned earlier, the. Providing the water is like that is our sole, that is our our, our sole and primary purpose is is is, is water services, um, and we throughout the state we take thousands of samples um, every day, and we have actually five labs um, that handle uh, testing for us um, that that are our own labs throughout New Jersey. The one that services uh, testing here locally is at our Swimming River Water Treatment Plant. Um, in Coltsneck. Um, and then we also have um, a central lab in, in Belleville, Illinois, which handles um, uh, more of the more, not the day to day testing. Uh, and that's used, utilized by all of our state uh, subsidiaries. And that's, uh, that's an amazing facility. It's, uh, it's, it's 
to go through that, it's that's that's definitely uh, tech heavy. It's it's one of as mentioned, one of the most uh, advanced water quality labs in the country, uh, and we were proud that that's one of ours. And we also have five plants uh, throughout the country that have won uh, directors' awards from the EPA uh, for, uh, which is a program that they do to recognize facilities that um, surpass. The, the minimum federal and state um, drinking water standard requirements. And again, uh, tying back to the, to the website there, if you go on to, the, uh, to our website right there, uh, one of the top bars is water quality. And if you click that, uh, it'll drop down information. You can pick which area you live in. Um, Coastal North is the area that, that you are in right now, but you can get information there from all of the all of the areas of the state, and if you are also a customer that has property somewhere else, you can pull up information, pick another state, and dive into dive into the to the results for that. So now we'll talk a little more locally. Um, you can see right here, here we are, here's Ocean Township, and um, so we serve uh, our coastal north uh, district uh, is, is pretty large. It covers all the way up here into uh, Hazlitt and Homedale and Union Beach and it comes down through here's Ocean Township, Asbury Park um, it stops right there uh, uh, in Avon and then we pick up again in uh, Howell uh, this is the section of Howell that we serve this is Lakewood Township of the section we serve this is uh, of Lakewood and Union <coughs> and then we have um, facilities in Tom's River and Brick along the Barrier Island. Um, so starting in Bayhead and coming down through um, to Orkney Beach, and then a little tiny island out there, Pelican Island, which is half Berkeley, half uh, Tom's River. Um, uh, that's us as uh, that's us as well. Um, why is the distribution so broken up? Uh, a lot of it comes from just how, uh, and you'll see in a little bit, like the the company is is kind of comprised of of, of what were smaller companies that then that then merged and and became sections. So where in what, where they were written uh, was as a predecessor was called Monmouth Consolidated, um, and then uh, Lakewood was uh, the Lakewood Water Company. Uh, there was Bayhead had. Uh, I think it was called, um, there was Bayhead Water, but then also there was Shore Water, uh, going back to like the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so it, it just kind of um, grew organically or by, by kind of little, little companies merging into, into bigger areas. Uh, and then some, some are like Belmar is, uh, is, has their own water system. Uh, Lavalette, you can see right here, Lavalette has their own water system. So uh, it's, it's a mix. And then in Coastal North, it's about 41 communities. It's about 365,000 customers between here. Um, and it's about, on average, like 17 and a half billion gallons of water uh, that come out of uh, the system and, and delivered to the customers each year. And to where, where your water comes from specifically, so in the coastal north area, we have we have uh, there's the stars here mark where there's uh, treatment facilities, but the big stars and it's not really shown up too well there. But the big stars are 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 large primary treatment plants. Um, swimming River is in Colts Neck, and its source of supply is the Swimming River Reservoir, and uh, the Swimming River Reservoir and the Swimming River uh, plant produce most of the water for for this area here. Um, the next, so all of everything up in through here, now Shorelands has two small plants of their own, but they only run seasonally uh, in the summertime, in the off season, all of, all of the water that was the Shorelands and the Shoreland system um, comes, from, comes from the Swimming River. Um, we also have a plant, uh, the Jumping Brook plant, which is uh, on Old Portleys Avenue uh, in Neptune, uh, not too far west of the hospital. And um, that plant, um, that, that site, just like our Swing River plant, the Swing River plant, um, the reservoir uh, was built in, uh, 
1899-1900 is when that was called the Tilton uh, Water Company, Tilton Manor Water Company. Um, so that that is a man-made uh, reservoir, uh, but it's been been there now for quite some time. The same with Jumping Brook. Uh, Jumping Brook treatment plant uh, was built in the late 1800s. Uh, 1910 was was like its the last upgrade of its old old style um, at that time before it was modernized in the 50s. But uh, that that facility uses um, the Glendora Reservoir, uh, which we built, and then it also, we also have an intake on the Shark River. Um, and the Shark River, though, is in that point is really not too much of a river. Uh, it's really only used um, when there's like high stream uh, demand, like if our flow from a rain event. We have we have um, a stream gauge there. We have to pass by so much water, and so we can only use that um, intake when the when the flow is up from from rain. Um, and but the, so Jumping Brook's primary source is uh, Glendola. And it uh, also gets water. We can take water from from Manuswan as well. And then Oak, Oak Glen is in Howell. Um, it was uh, part of the of the uh, Howell water uh, system, uh, which is if you've ever been to uh, past here, um, the Oak Glen plant has the uh, Howell Board of Education is in the front, and our plant is in the in the back. And um, the Howell plant. Mostly gets its water from uh, the Manuswan Reservoir. Um, so, uh, Oakland plant pretty much serves uh, like what this is. This is known as kind of the Lakewood district of uh, Coastal Illinois. This is called the uh, Shrewsbury of the Monmouth district. So, uh, Swain River and Jumping Brook are the main main suppliers of the water for here. Uh, Oakland down here, but we do have the ability to move water back and forth uh, if we. If we have a higher demand in one area, we can we can like share water from amongst the, uh, the plants. Do you have pipes like are there underground pipes? Like how do you share? If, through that, if we have uh, we have uh, um, uh, large uh, transmission mains that are 24 to 36 inch diameter uh, that that move water. We don't have connections on those. They're used just to move water through through the system. From one point to another, so uh, we have quite a few because Lakewood is is one of the fastest growing areas in in the state. We have um, three. We're building a fourth transmission main to, to get more water from Oakland down into the into the Lakewood area, and then we can also move water um, up up into up into the Monmouth area and 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 around like that. Uh, we did that actually fairly recently. The Oakland plant is being um, uh, renovated and expanded right now, so it was offline uh, for for about four days uh, a few weeks ago, and so with that plant down, we were we were using the Jumping Brook plant to to supply the water uh, down into that area, um, and we do have some smaller. There's a small iron removal facility that was down in um, in Monterey section of the Barrier Island. Uh, it used to be uh, a mini golf site, and now it's um, uh, we built it to kind of be in, in kind of touch and sync with the community. So it looks like a looks like a beach house. Like you would drive right by it and not even know, except for the fact that there's a giant water tank uh, next to it. That, that it's, uh, uh, but it has a front porch with rocking chairs and, and everything. It looks uh, uh, it's a pretty good spot there. Um, and then. Uh, we also have some. Uh, we have a plant, a smaller plant in uh, in Lakewood, and um, I said the, the two up there for uh, shorelands. Can you explain the difference going back to the? Um, there's a solid red and light and red is Oh, sure. And then you have right here. Yep. But you also have a dark red in the middle. Yep. That that's uh, Ocean Township. I just added some emphasis there to point out Ocean Township. And uh, the striped area here, it, it indicates that it's water and sewer, that we have water and sewer there. And also you see the striped area here. We have um, <coughs> sewer in what used to be the Adelphia uh, system in, in Howell. I guess I'm asking why you delineated between 
the lighter and the darker. Is it, what's going on here? Did I miss that? Oh no, I just, I just did it just so okay. it was easy to see where Ocean Township was. Okay. Since we were okay. in Ocean Township. Oh, we in Ocean New York. Oh, okay. Yep. Is the map is a, a good little, I, I wanted to just point out right where, so you can kind of where you were in relation to the rest of the okay. system. Yep. Can I ask you about se um, security for the water? Sure. The, and and like I was I mentioned, uh, uh, even though the, 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 how how New Jersey American Water, uh, you know, what kind of what is that faceless uh, corporation sometimes? But we're actually here. We're even though we are we have a the, the parent. All of our operations are local, and, and all of the, everyone that works here is is here. And, and a lot of times we've been here for quite a while. Like this is um, I love going through our, our uh, archives. We have we have uh, really cool uh, old old drawings. This is uh, so this is looking north. So this is as if you'd be from the ocean. This is Deal Lake. Here's the the New Jersey Transit, when it was called Long Branch Railroad. Mm -hmm. This is the North Asbury train station, which is now um, the Visiting Nurse Association there. Um, and then you can see here's Interlaken, West Allenhurst, and then Wanamasa. And this one, if you can quite see, that's uh, 1911 is the date on that. Um, and you can see here, this was laying out uh, the water lines for the Wanamasa section. And then um, this is the, uh, this is the, I said the, the Tilton Manor Water Company. This is the original swimming river reservoir. This was the dam and the intake structure. This was uh, 1900. And uh, this is Lakewood. This was Lakewood Water. Uh, this is 1886. Uh, uh, the horse-drawn um, uh, cart that they had for uh, for uh, their customer service. They delivered water. No, well, they would go around and. and but when they were doing service calls and things that they had, they had her cars, right? They had that was their that was their utility truck, uh, one horsepower. Um, and this is oh, I'll go back. Um, this one is the uh, um, it's not quite Ocean Township. This is on the Asbury Circle uh, where the Coca Cola uh, oh, yeah. former Coca Cola bottling was. Mm -hmm. That was. Uh, called West Asbury Park then. That was the East Jersey Coast Water Company. This is, uh, I think, 1911 or 1912. Uh, there we had actually a facility there with wells, <coughs> smokestack, uh, and a small treatment plant there. Uh, and then in 1945, the plan say that's when we sold it, and Coca-Cola um, moved their, uh, their bottling works in there. Um, and just starting now talking about like uh, as Lane had brought up about investing in the infrastructure and the fact that the infrastructure throughout the country is is in uh, you know a lot of it was put in about the same time um, especially after after post-war uh, development growth and a lot of that stuff is starting to age out and and in, is in need of repair or replacement so uh, how what is where does your water bill go, uh, and and what are we doing to make sure that we have that um, infrastructure on the, um, ready for the future? So, uh, on American Water as a whole spends roughly a billion to um, plus or minus uh, a billion, one point two or so uh, dollars a year on capital projects throughout the country on our on our water systems. Um, and specifically to New Jersey, this past year um, and the year we're in right now, we're about I think 300 and around 350, 300 million somewhere in that range, uh, just for New Jersey this year alone on uh, on on uh, capital projects uh, throughout either plants or uh, distribution system. And in our area here, in the, in the coastal north area. We've spent about 58 million in the past three years alone on treatment plant upgrades, distribution system upgrades, um, and specific just to Ocean County or uh, Ocean Township. Um, we've spent about 4.8 million on main replacement projects. About 24,000 feet of our water mains we've replaced. It's a little difficult to see, but um, 
the, this map had um, cars a little more vivid on the map, on the screen there. You can see where those projects uh, took place throughout the throughout the township. Um, and back to that point of of infrastructure improvement. Um, the one thing, and, and it had, we talked a little bit about it, uh, Lena did, and then also we were talking about it during the break, is is lead services. And um, for our customers, and it varies with different water companies, um, even water um, authorities, on what owns and who owns what. Uh, with New Jersey American, uh, the, we own up to the, um, to the curb stop or the meter pit. If there's a meter pit at the street or in the curb line, that's what we own too. Or the shut off at the curb, we own to that. The customer owns beyond that, into the house from, from that point into the house. So when we do the projects, when we do um, uh, water line replacements, we'll replace the water line and we'll also replace the service and the meter pit typically at our on our side. But we don't do anything with the customer side. That's that's the customer's responsibility. Um, in light of um, Flint and, and looking at, at lead services, um, we have um, taken steps to go through it as we're doing projects. If we come across uh, a lead service and it's on our side, we replace that, we know where those are. We don't really know what's on the customer side because it's their side. They, they may have replaced it, they may have not. So when we're doing work either through replacement or just, just general repair work, if we find that the customer has uh, a lead service line, we will reach out to them and say, are you interested in having us replace it for you uh, at our cost? Um, not always um, easy because either, especially in our Lakewood area, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of <coughs> Older properties are not owner occupied; they're, they're used as renters, uh, rentals. So we have to get in touch with the owner and and then have them agree, and then we arrange for a plumber to come in and replace the line uh, into the house. So um, if we if we find that while we're doing work, we will we will do that and get that get that replaced. I you know, the reason for the main replacement projects. What's the real reason for that? Because this. Lead or uh, no? We don't have. We typically don't have a lot of lead mains. Um, in fact, mo like the lead mains, we did have some um, galvanized mains down on the barrier island. A lot of the barrier island was actually these small two-inch galvanized water lines that were unlined. So then they they were they like, through, through the years they were they were pretty small. So and they didn't have any fire protection there. In a lot of the areas on the barrier island because it wasn't really built out initially it was you know little shacks cottages not really intended for three-story um houses like are down there now so after the storm we did go through and replace um most of the distribution system and we replaced everything down there that was undersized um so every every area through the barrier island now has um, fire protection Size mains that they cannot hide it on. So uh, the big drivers for main replacement, uh, we have a, like a model that that takes a couple bunch of factors into account. It looks at the age of the main. It looks at the material, whether it's typically it's either cast iron, is what the pre-war uh, up and through like the 50s were. Uh, we also have uh, transite pipe, which is a non-metallic uh, pipe. And we have then the newer, I'll say newer pipe from like the 60s on is, is um, ductile iron. So we'll go, we'll use the age of the pipe, the material of the pipe. Do we have um, uh, issues with, with um, discolored water or um, do we have low fire flows? Um, and we look at all those things and it kind of helps us um, determine what areas have the highest priority for replacement. In terms of fire flow means there's enough water pressure to Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. So um, each year we have to um, go through and inspect and flush uh, and operate hydrants <coughs> and valves throughout the system. And so when we're doing that, that kind of gives us our database to know what is the fire flow coming out of that hydrant. Um, we can see that and kind of be able to start to see where we have where we have issues. And we also meet 
a lot, a lot with the municipalities, and and they tell us um, where they have areas that are like hot, hot button areas for them. So that's really what drives our, our main replacement. Or what's been happening a lot lately is if there's a state or county or local roads project going on, we'll go in and replace the main at the same time. So right now in Asbury, we're replacing mains on 4th and 5th because the town was in replacing sewer and they're gonna pave the road. And the county is gonna do um, Main Street, so we're replacing Main Street from end to end because they're gonna pave it as well. Um, and then some of our community partnership, uh, our local things, we have uh, an environmental grant program um, that uh, the grants can be for up to $10,000 for community-based projects uh, that are for either improving, restoring, or protecting uh, source water. And um, so far we've done about 250000 uh, for 32 projects in New Jersey. We have, the next slide will show some of the local ones here. Uh, we have a speakers bureau, kind of like what I'm doing today. Uh, and we also have plant tours at, at some of our uh, Swing River plant and the Jumping Brook plant. Um, we can have groups come in and, and take a tour of the plant. Um, and we also do um, firefighter and emergency responder grants um, for buying equipment or supplies that they need. Um, and then we have our volunteer um, uh, groups, and actually that's um, where I was before, I'm going to go back to where you have a beach cleanup today, the beach sweep is in Asbury, so we have, we have uh, folks there today. And on the, the two of the grants, um, it's kind of typical what they are, one, the Manaslaw Board Writers Club, uh, they got a uh, $2,500 grant to establish a Leave Only Your Footprints program of, of basically uh, taking, with, taking out with you what you brought to the beach. And uh, also, Stockton University um, has a has a, a girls' summer camp for science and technology. Sure. And uh, one of the things they do at the end of that is they take home uh, their project. And it's hard to see there right now, but uh, they build rain barrels and then they take them back in the community and install them somewhere in their in their neighborhood. And uh, that's it for that. So I'm open for any uh, any questions. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the, one of the slides that you showed at the very beginning, <coughs> it, it, the reservoir is the main uh, s source of the water now. Mm -hmm. And most of these things were very up, up, done over 100 years old. So, and since the population is so, so much greater now, <coughs> I'm trying to th think how the wells could have uh, supplied the, the, the increased demand. Um, we do have wells, although um, for each of the aquifers that they're drilled into, we we have withdrawal limits set by the DEP. So we are even if we have wells over here and, and six other wells there, if they're tied into the same aquifer, normally our, our withdrawal is set by set by how much we're taking of that specific aquifer. So um, we can't always just drill another well because if our allocation is if we've already um, met what we can take from that from that aquifer, um, and that really becomes a, a challenge. Is as the communities grow more, and the, and in this area especially in Lakewood grows, where is our where is that water uh, coming from? Um, you know, we only can have so much take, and and we have to manage that through conservation or through um, finding another source of supply. That was, I have two questions, burning questions. All right. <laughs> and then one of them was just that we've had droughts and we've been asked to cut back. My daughter lives in California and it's even worse out there. But they're talking about a like, population doubling within the next, I guess, 100 years. But New Jersey is already very densely populated. Um, is your company like looking ahead to the future to other ways of of getting water, maybe desalinating seawater or something like that. And should I tell you my second question? Sure. Okay, okay, yeah. um, my concern is also I hear that the EPA like they're being pressured to cut back their standards. If the standards are cut back on the safety of our drinking water, is New Jersey American committed to a certain standard? above whatever the government issues or if the government says, oh, you know, uh, I'm exaggerating, it's all right, yeah, I have a little lead in the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband was telling me that there's like new things coming out and the government hasn't even yet 
uh, said anything about them. What is what would your company be doing to protect us as far as safety of the water and availability of the water? Yeah, those are good questions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the, the first piece um, how we plan for the future. So um, we do um, through the through the, the, the engineering group, uh, the, they have a planning group, they do uh, a comprehensive planning study, a CPS, and that's done on a regular interval um, where they go in and they do a full analysis of the system, and it's about this thick of a document, um, and it discusses all the, basically how the system operates, where water comes from, then it goes through what are the projected demands as far as population, what's the population expected to do, uh, is it going to be residential versus industrial or commercial? And then it also looks at this, the state of the infrastructure at each of the main facilities and the distribution system and says, OK, here is where we see areas that, um, that we need to, to look at. And then they lay out um, recommended options for, for consideration. So we can say, OK, yeah, we, this is this is a priority. Okay, yes, let's start looking at the at the more detailed planning on, on that. So it helps us stay looking ahead. It's a little bit um, speculative because you know we don't really know um, always what will happen. Uh, but we try to we take what we have currently and and past history and say, okay, this is what we expect growth to do, or this is what we foresee being our our issues, and then. We try to start to plan for that. Um, source of supply is, for this area, is probably one of the, the biggest um, uh, <coughs> challenges is where will the water come from if the growth continues as it is, and, and how, do we, how do we do that? Um, the California American uh, system, uh, the Monterey system, they're, they're pursuing uh, desalination. Um, it's very, very expensive. Um, uh, but that was that was their um, that was their only option. Um, mm -hmm. That was the that was the most cost effective. It is it is it is it is that, uh, very very expensive both to construct and also to treat and also is very is also very power intensive, um, extremely power intensive, and also has um, its own. Um, uh, uh, challenges where you end up with a highly uh, concentrated salt um, effluent because you're pulling the salt. Oh, right. it has to salt has to go somewhere. someplace. So those are just things that that um, that that play into that. It's it, the project in California has been probably I'd say 10 to 15 years in the making of how to address the problems on the Monterey Peninsula. It's still, still. On the um, as far as uh, contaminants and, and EPA and its restrictions, um, uh, she mentioned earlier, the state can actually uh, require more than what, what the EPA does, and, and in many cases that is the case here. Um, um, the e this local DEP, the state DEP, for several things actually is more stringent than what the, than what it is on a, on on a federal level, and and also internally as a company we we do we also do more than on some things like the amount of tests that we take in a day of, of uh, our samples of the plants. Um, we normally take uh, sometimes twice what what is required just so one we have that data and two it just gives us just gives us a better baseline. Um, so it's hard, it's. To know exactly what it would be, I'm not. I'm not sure. It really depends on on what the what the change would be. But but lead is something that we're we're trying to be out in the front of. That's that's something that we we see as as a risk to our customers, and so we want to be proactive and go in. And if we know that the services there and we're doing work there, we're gonna we want to offer the customer to be able to get it replaced. Okay. Yeah. I think we'll have one more question, and then. At the end, we have an open question forum, so you can continue on answering your own questions. I just wanted to ask you about security for the swimming river reservoir and for other reservoirs, because I sometimes get <coughs> conspiracy theories and say that would be really could take a lot of us out if you did something to the water. Um, it, it, 
the Swim River Reservoir is is so large, it would be very difficult to to no, it would actually be difficult to to put in something that would be so uh, right that it would that it would. Uh, but it could happen more unintentionally. Like we were very mindful of, of the roads that cross all of our reservoirs, and we have we've had a case where we had a school bus last year go into the reservoir and throw off the road. Wasn't it? There were no students in it, um, luckily. But uh, we do have at all of our facilities we have um, spill response um, uh, booms and torbids and, and things, and we also have source water monitors on our. Um, on our service work things that give us real-time constant streaming of, of work product data that we can see and see if there's a, an issue. And also, and while people don't really like it, uh, we don't allow boating or any recreational use of Swimming River Reservoir. Um, even if you live there, we actually own 15 feet back from the water line, so they can't even have docks. Like, it really is, we try to keep it as as um, uh, untouched as possible. Great, right, thank you, William. Thank you very much. I know there are probably five or six more questions. Just one. But I'm trying to at least um, get all my speakers in so that you can from everybody. Um, so the next presentation will be Amy Gulsman. From the New Jersey, she is the New Jersey State Director of Clean Water Action, and she's going to talk on home safe home and how to protect water through the use of non-toxic non products in your home. Amy has been director of the New York State Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund. For almost 40 years, she has organized and led a wide variety of grassroots and national coalitions, educational programs, and public empowerment campaigns focused on diesel, toxics, water, pesticides, solid waste, healthy schools, energy, climate, and environmental justice and health. Since 1992, Amy has served as New York State Director of Clean Water Coalition for Healthy Ports, New York and New Jersey. She serves on the board of the New Jersey Work Environment Council, and the governor, she's the governor's appointee to New Jersey's Clean Water Council. From 1994 to 2002, she was part of the National Training Consortium, engaging workers, community, and environmental justice leaders in funding common ground. She directed Clean Water Action's New England programs from 1985 to 92, and prior to that, Nuclear waste and power plant safety for over six years. She has a BS in land use planning from the University of Minnesota and she received the New Jersey Governor's 2004 Environmental Achievement Award. I think we have lots of credentials. Yeah, I didn't expect you to read it all. <laughs> I thought you'd pick and choose. Well, you know, I wasn't sure about the yeah. time because everybody okay. needs a few minutes to set up. And okay, so we call her in. All right. Okay. Thank you. Take it in. I'm not using a projector. No, this will be a, a change of pace. Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet if people would like to get future action alerts and things from our organization. Please just um, sign up. And you can always opt out if you decide at some point you don't want to. And the other thing is um, I have a book here that has uh, fact sheets on green cleaning and on drinking water uh, filter options about our programs. We have a thing on food uh, waste composting and also talks about lead in soil. Uh, we have a rethink disposable program, um, how to make your event uh, trash free or uh, minimize your trash. And um, we also have some uh, uh, activation campaign at the federal and at the state level. And we have a very exciting program we have called 100 for Clean Water, which we're um, looking for. So I'm going to have this here. And um, they're in rain sheets. So if you're interested in something, just pull it out and take it and take it home. Um, some of it's on our website. Some of it's a little hard to find on our website. So 
I'd rather, um, you know, if you want it, uh, take it with you, or you can always uh, contact our art organization. There's also membership information in there. So I'm going to do uh, kind of a speed, uh, speed, uh, speed training here, and I have sort of two uh, bags of tricks here. One's a bucket, obviously, and one's uh, a bag full of things. And one has to do more with uh, alternatives to controlling pests in your house uh, without toxic chemicals, and the other has to do with green cleaning. And um, whether you use pesticides indoors or outdoors, or you use cleaning products, or you use detergents to wash your car, and all those kinds of things, it ends up in our waterways, it ends up in our storm drains. And actually, uh, New Jersey's passed some laws uh, that were targeted towards Barnegat Bay, but actually it's a statewide law about fertilizers. And actually in the state of New Jersey, you can only purchase uh, uh, less intense fertilizers and they are slow release fertilizers. So um, in an effort uh, originally again to try to address the Barnegat Bay uh, pollution issues uh, around the fertilizer, use of fertilizers, um, but it, it, it is a statewide policy, so um, you don't need to use quite as much on, on your yards and things like that. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, pests first, and uh, we actually, normally when I go out and do a, a program, uh, I do a catch the critter game, uh, but uh, that usually involves kids and, you know, parents trying to guess, you know, what can you use to to catch different critters. So I'm just going to tell you what they are. <laughs> they go faster. Um, and also because uh, we're limited in time and I want to cover sort of both avenues. So um, I'm taking out a few things here from my bag of tricks. And um, one of those things is uh, this is a, a, a yellow jacket trap. Um, you can actually make, you don't have to buy one, uh, this happens to be a bought one. Um, you put in a kind of a sweet substance in it, the, the yellow jackets and, and hornets, they fly in but they can't fly out. And they get caught and you just hang them, you know, outside, um, you know, if you're having a picnic or hang them off your umbrella, you know, that's uh, giving you shade. Uh, we've used these at uh, big festival events, you know, and you get a few of them, they really work. You can also make them, you just take a big soda bottle and um, you can go online and go to YouTube and they'll tell you how to make them for practically nothing. Um, and you, you know, put some soda or some beer or something that's sweet that'll track them and, and capture them. So you can get this at the Home Depot, it's pretty cheap. Um, you can get a few of them um, or go to a place that you find is a problem. So that's Yellow Jackets. All right, this is um, a pantry pest trap. Um, Sometimes you might buy a flower, you know, and it has moths in it already. It's just contaminated when you buy it, but sometimes you get them and they're like flying all over your place. Um, you can pass this around if you want, but I have to get it back. Um, if you put your finger inside of it, you will realize why it works. Um, just, uh, it's sticky on the inside. Um, you just put them in your closet or wherever you're finding the moss. There's a pheromone, they're attracted to the smell and they go inside and um, so they get stuck and they don't come out. This is a um, this is uh, something that uh, our organization actually passed a school uh, integrated pest management law that requires schools to use least toxic options as the first resort. <laughs> and um, using spot treating, um, whether it's outside or inside. Um, this is something that you find commonly, uh, you know, you can find it in your own house if you buy them, but uh, a lot of schools use them. These are roach motels. Uh, again, you know, they check in, but they never check out. And uh, they have little slots, you know, and they go in, and again, they're attracted to a pheromone uh, or a smell that they, only they smell. Um, these are really cheap, um, you know, kids aren't going to go and start gnawing at them, and, you know, eating them, they're, they're uh, non-toxic in, in that regard. Uh, 
This is, uh, this might be familiar to some people, if you, if you don't like cutting off mouse's heads, you can, um, you can get a live trap. <laughs> and uh, this one's a little slightly broken, but it gets the point across, right? You can, um, you know, put a bait in here, food, and they'll go in, and then it, you know, it would close, and you take them, take them outside, you know, or take them far away, <laughs> whatever. You can use snap traps, snap traps work. Um, they do snap on the on the animal. Uh, some some mice are pretty smart. <laughs> they avoid it somehow. They get the food without getting snapped. But it is a non-toxic way to you know get rid of a mouse. So that's another non-toxic way. Um, obviously, if you have frogs, uh, they like bugs. Uh, ladybugs like bugs. Let's see what else they got in here? Like bugs too. Yes, uh, my cat loves to chase bugs. Um, so these four things all um, help in, with one particular uh, insect. Uh, they uh, very often it's seasonal, but we get these little ants that start walking across our kitchen floor or on our counter. Um, I used to have ants in a third floor apartment that would walk the cat food. I mean, they grab the cat food and they would like move the cat food across the floor. It's like, whoa, this is like way too much for me. So um, there's a couple of things that you can do, all of which are non-toxic, so you don't have to worry about pets. You know, that's the other thing about this stuff, right? Because pets eat this stuff. So if you use uh, a lemon juice or a Tabasco or a cayenne pepper um, and you make like a little line, you figure out where the ants are coming in. So say the ants were coming in here. You could put a little line of lemon juice or, or the cayenne pepper or, or the Tabasco and you make a little line but they don't cross the line. They don't like that vinegary smell. They don't like, you know, that kind of stuff. And if you, I'll come to your question. Yes. And if you figure out actually where they do come in, if you use some caulk, you could just caulk the crack and then they won't come in, right? Insects come where it's warm, wet, and where there's food. So if you eliminate those things, um, you know, you can get some relief from some of these pests. None of these, I mean, bees can bite you, you know. We don't really like mice eating, gnawing into our food, right? Um, but uh, any of these things will, will take care of some of the very common pests, and you won't have to use chemicals in your house, outside your house, and therefore it won't get into the water. You have a question? Um, I can add something to that which is really great. Peppermint oil, mm -hmm. essential peppermint oil. I, when we get ants, which we've had twice, we've lived here now mm -hmm. for like eight years, yeah. <laughs> and I sprinkle it on the counters mm -hmm. and the ants go away. Yeah. I, I love the smell. Okay. Right. And it, that's the other thing. It just makes everything smell so nice. Mm -hmm. It also works on fruit flies because we yeah. keep a compost container in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And my husband was complaining the other night because I got Carol, so I sprinkled a little and they just kind of go. They just go away. So it smells kind of oil, and I also put it in my garbage cans. It just smells so nice. And it does the job. Did you have a question? Yeah. What about those ant traps? Are those bad? Like the Roche Motel? And they well, no, they're not. They're not as. Um, they're one of the least toxic options, and in essence, they're small. They're in case. They tend to have, you know, a, a scent that they are attracted to. Um, you know, it's all self-contained, so kids, pets, you know, they're not going to start chewing through the plastic and stuff. So those ant things work. Um, you know, I prefer this other option because, you know, if you were drinking, you know, Tabasco, it might like burn you a little bit, but it's not, it's not because it's going to, you know, it's not like lye going down your throat, right? It's not going to cause a problem. So whenever I have an option of using a food substance or like a peppermint oil, I always try and use that before I go to a, you know, an ant trap kind of thing or, or a roach motel. It's just a preference. Yeah. Yeah. But the main thing is if you have the food, the water and the warmth, you know, they're going to come in. It's like termites. If you have wet wood, you can do all, you can bomb the place, but if you still have that wet wood, you're going you're gonna to get termites to come back. So you have to take care of the source of the, of the problem. So. Um, and with ants, you know, figuring out where they come in and they crack, you know, doing the caulking, you know, you get the weatherization plus you get the caulking, you know, you get the ants out. 
All right, so I'm going to move, switch, switch categories here. Um, I actually have a third thing I'm going to do, so that's why I'm kind of rushing along here. Um, you only need a couple of things in your house to actually get your house to be clean. And, and most of the rest of the stuff you should you know, use up and, and not keep replacing it with the same thing. So um, if you have uh, baking soda and you have vinegar in your house and you have uh, soap that's, that doesn't have antibacterials in it, and um, this is an old box from the Borax. They, they keep changing the cover, so I don't know what the cover looks like now. Um, used to have the, the girl with the mule team, right? The, you know, the wagons. Um, but this is borax. And then this is bone on me. This is a uh, mineral. It's not, it doesn't have any bleach in it, but it's similar to like a comet or something else, all right? And then this is Murphy's oil soap. Okay, this is a vegetable-based uh, soap. You can use it on wood, counters, um, gives it a shine. You want to make sure you don't use tons of it because then you know you could get a buildup. But if you you know use it well, you can use it with a spray. It comes in a, a bottle where you can just put it in the bucket and mop your floor. Um, it does all those things. So um, you can use vinegar to do windows. You can use vinegar actually to do linoleum floors. Um, you could uh, you know make salad dressing out of it. <laughs> so that's always a good test. Like, can I eat this and not worry about being sick, right? So, and it's really cheap. You don't have to buy Heinz brand. You could buy XYZ brand. It doesn't really matter. Um, and so you can use this for a lot of different things and, and disinfecting if you want to clean your coffee pot. It works for that. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can use vinegar as a sort of all-purpose cleaner. It's not a disinfectant. Okay. The other thing is uh, baking soda uh, does a lot of things. Um, you can have baking soda and chase it with vinegar and hot water in your drain and it'll clean your drain out. Now, it may not work. Uh, it does work. <laughs> it does always work. But you might have to plunge a little bit. You know, you might have to do it a few times. Um, but you don't have to use, you know, drain up. So this will break up, you know, uh, the hairballs and all that kind of stuff. It works in your bathtub, it'll work in your sink. Um, so use some baking soda, chase it with vinegar, you see a little science experiment, and, and, um, and uh, you know, there'll be no fumes from it, which is really important because a lot of these drainos, you're in this bathroom in a sort of confined space, and then you're like breathing these fumes, then you're, you're in a uh, respiratory distress, um, and that's a really big problem, right? So, um, and then use hot water. And then you might need to, to plunge as well. Plungers, you know, they're, they're non-toxic, uh, you get a little exercise, <laughs> they do the job, okay? You use them in toilets, you know, uh, you can use them in sinks uh, and a variety of things. So uh, that's uh, uh, what I would advocate. This does lots of other things. You can um, um, it does a lot of other things. You could also make it into a little bit of a paste, and you could use it to clean your oven. You know, if you have um, you know stuff built up in in the in the bottom of your oven, you could also I use it sometimes uh, if your pan you have a pan you burnt, you put a little bit in the pan with a little bit of water uh, and let it sit there for a little bit as a paste, and then you know um, use a, a scrubber. So. You know, all of these things, they, they have the benefit of, they don't cause a water pollution problem, they don't cause a health problem for you, for your pets, you're not getting uh, skin rashes, you know, that kind of thing. So all of those are good. This is, as I said, Mona Me, it's a, it's a mineral, um, it doesn't have bleach in it, uh, you use it as an abrasive, you know, similar to what you would use um, with a comet or a bleach. Some people are like, I gotta use bleach. Like I just cooked with meat, you know, I, I, you know, my counter's got, you know, stuff on it. I'm really worried. I want to disinfect. So this is what I tell people. One is, if you're cutting meat, you know, use a plastic cutting board, cut on the cutting board, put the cutting board in your dishwasher. Okay? So then one, you're sort of limiting your 
you know, your exposure. The other is, is I do have a small container of comet, you know, or whatever underneath my sink. And I have a fish tank, so like I don't want to have salmonella all over my counter when I inadvertently spill, you know, the turtle water, you know, whatever. So I want to have a little bit of a backup, right? So what I do is I take, you know, a small piece of paper towel, I put a little bit of the comet bleach on that towel, I wet the towel, and I clean, you know, locally. So I'm just cleaning this spot that I got contaminated. I'm using something that um, I'm not worried about transferring it to, you know, if I use it later for my sink, I'm not because I'm going to throw that little piece of paper towel in the garbage. And so I've taken care of this sort of disinfecting issue that I have, okay? Uh, the same is true, uh, a lot of people like to use bleach. And I just say, don't use bleach, ever, if you can avoid it. In this case, you know, this comet has a little bit of bleach, but it's, again, very localized. I'm using it for a very specific spot, a very specific purpose. You don't need bleach, you know, in your laundry. You don't need bleach to, you know, clean. Most things, if you use hot, soapy water, um, it's enough. The way you disinfect things, um, or the way that you clean things, actually is the friction that's doing that. Unless you have a medical situation where you need something bleached, it's 1% bleach, it's not like the whole bottle and you pour it all over the place, right? So again, just be prudent about, you know, do you have a medical situation? Do you have to have something really, you know, antiseptic? Can you localize how much, you know, where it is? Can you use a, you know, not a spray bottle because you don't want to be spraying bleach all over the place. But you certainly don't want to make the mistake of, you know, mixing things together with bleach and then having an explosion in your house or, or ending up in the hospital, which can happen um, when people, you know, put ammonia and bleach together. My mother loves ammonia. I'm like, ah! You know, but, you know, if people make a mistake and they put ammonia and bleach together, you know, you could be in the hospital. So, um, so another thing about bleach is, you know, if you like your whitened things, well, use borax or use vinegar or there's other things that you can use that are, that's not bleach. The other thing is bleach is an irritant, so it's going to, it's, and if you're using bleach in your wash, that means that's going down the drain, that means it's getting into our waterways, we don't want to do that, right? So, um, one thing I say to people is they go, oh, I have this favorite blouse, it has to be perfect, you know, and I go, well, you don't have to wash all your laundry <laughs> with bleach. You know, if you really have this one thing you need to wash, then wash the one thing. Um, and don't use, you know, big load. You know, wash the one thing or wash the one stain out or whatever you need. If you have rings around your collar, you don't need to use bleach. Use shampoo because actually shampoo takes the oil out of fabric. Um, better than anything else because think about what shampoo is doing to your head, right? It's pulling oils off your head. Um, and um, so if you use that around rings or, um, you know, armpits that get, you know, sweaty and perspiration, you want to take the stain out, you use shampoo, it'll take it out. So you're not using bleach, you're using something else that's not going to be toxic um, to the environment, you know, in moderation. So really big advocate of um, you know, a lot of people say, I want my undershirts and everything perfectly white. I go like, who's going to see your undershirt? Like, really? Does it have to be perfectly white? Um, you know, maybe somebody who you're intimate with, you know, but most people you see you're not intimate with. Um, and also, to be honest, you don't want to have bleach, you know, around your private parts. Um, it's an irritant. It can cause infections, urinary tract infections. So, you don't, you know, if you can avoid bleach, do that so it protects you and it protects the environment, protects the water. Okay, so any questions about that? How much time do I have? Oh, Mary, do you know how much time I have left? Okay, how much? Okay. So, an enemy is in the yellow part and it doesn't scratch. Yes, it doesn't scratch. You can use it five minutes? Yes, and you can use it less, and you can use it on glass. And, yeah, you can use it on glass, it doesn't scratch. Right, it's Pyrex, for, you know, you can use it on. Pretty much anything, yeah. Um, a lot of times they have things on here, you know, they give you, you know, pictures, instructions, 
Um, I mean, you can brush your teeth with this, you can make a cake. You know, again, <laughs> if, if, it, if it doesn't have like warning Will Robinson, you know, you're gonna get sick and call poison control, you know, you're in a, you're in a better situation for the environment, for the water, for yourself, right? Common scratches. Yes. This is much better. This one? Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about uh, the, uh, the, the, the warnings about bleach that you were That's the regular bleach. Bleach is, is bleach. A, what about the color safe bleach? Bleach is bleach. I mean, if, 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 if you put bleach in the environment or you put bleach down your throat, you're in the hospital and you've poisoned the environment. So the it doesn't. It, all it's saying color safe is, is basically trying to tell you that it's not going to destroy your fabric, um, you know, if it has a color to it, because you're using the, the bleach for a brightener as opposed to making something super white. It's still a bleach, it's still an irritant, it still causes problems. So whenever you can, if you want to brighten the color, we'll use something like this or use a vinegar, um, much more natural. So in my, yeah? Yes. If it's um, bleach is such a contaminant to our drinking water, yes. why is it even legally allowed to be sold? I mean, it's not even being sold as a controlled substance in any Well, uh, there's lots of things that, you know, we were talking about. There's, you know, was it 94 substances that are tested in drinking water, but the 68 known to be found in drinking water. There's 68,000 chemicals out there in the world. Most of them aren't tested. They're not regulated. Um, doesn't mean it's right. It's just that's the way the laws are set up, whether it's in this country or in another country, to make choices about what's regulated and what's not, what has safety precautions, what has labels on it, what doesn't have labels on it. Uh, many, many things are not tested, and we, we don't actually know whether harm is caused or not. So that, that's just a general statement about how we have product safety in the United States. It's not very safe or you don't know because the burden is actually, it's a reverse burden. You basically have to prove harm before the government decides to take precautionary measures in the United States. And it's the industry that supplies the information about safety, whether it's about drugs or products. But you know enough from things you've read that it's in our water system, in our drinking water. It doesn't get purified out of our drinking water, basically, if, you, if it goes down the drain, bleach. Well, bleach just, when it goes in, into our systems, I mean, water utilities can just handle so much stuff, and to be honest, a sewer treatment plant mm -hmm. is really designed to handle toilet waste, mm -hmm. you know, pee and poo. That's really what it's supposed to do. It's really not supposed to deal with all this other stuff mm -hmm. we put into the drain, whether it's from our home or from our industries. It's not really meant to do that. And so, you know, the sewer tr treatment plant are trying to do, you know, triple duty as much as they can, but, but then it gets to the drinking water plant, and the drinking water plant, you know, needs to have a clean, safe, affordable water, right? So the, the water utilities actually, to be honest, have been stepping up to the plate more and more and more to try and figure out ways to deal with these unregulated contaminants, mm -hmm. because um, you know, they could use reverse osmosis that might deal with certain things that aren't even regulated but would give us better protection or doing, you know, more aggressive, you know, you know, we use activated carbon filters, they have their fancier way of doing it. But um, utilities are actually trying to get, drinking water utilities, especially the larger ones, are trying to get ahead of the curve and trying to deal with more and more contaminants because the sewage treatment plants basically can't deal with it. And say the Passaic River, which is north, the Passaic River is both the place where the sewage is discharged and it's also where the intakes are for drinking water. So in drought, and which we've had, 100% um, of the flow is basically water that keeps recycling from the drinking water to the sewage tract to the drinking water. And so imagine if you have, you know, uh, fluoridated toothpaste, or you have people on chemo, or you know people are taking Viagra or, or birth control pills. You know that stuff is all going in the water, and the drinking water treatment plants aren't really designed to handle that, nor are the sewage treatment plants. So you're getting exposed to stuff, and so whenever we have an option to not use a toxic substance or to drive industry to go less toxic. 
You know, we should always do that. No, you don't hear enough of it. Okay. Well, it's more than it was 20 years ago, and it's going to be more, you know, every decade, it's, it's more and more and more. Are you seeing the millennials? I mean, you think see young people being more conscious of the environment? I would say, I would say yes. I think there's a lot more nervousness about where the world is going these days. I'm just going to say one thing, because I know you want to cut me off. No, um, you know, you have a little too I have a little too okay. I'm going to take my two minutes just to introduce you to something. And then if you have more questions at the very end, you can ask me. So we have a program called Rethink Disposable. If any of you go to Asbury Park or you've gone to Anchor's Bend or, you know, gone along the boardwalk, um, there are a number of businesses who are doing our campaign called It's a Straws on Demand campaign. It's also a campaign to reduce our use of single-use disposables. So like for me, when I got my sandwich, I just took a napkin, I didn't take the plate. Um, so that- they're, they're recyclable plates. Well, yeah, okay. All right, so let me have my 30 seconds, which is what I have left, okay? So um, our campaign is all about using reusables. So, um, Using, uh, you know, reusable sandwich cups, using, uh, here's a, this is a Christmas straw, but a reusable straw. There's stainless steel ones now, are getting really fancy. But this is obviously a reusable cup. Um, I actually brought my own silverware, but you can carry around your own little bag of tricks in your bag. This happens to be plastic, but you could use, you know, metal. Um, we do events. Uh, this is a basket that we purchased. It's a thick uh, wax paper liner. Uh, we do events. We just did one in Asbury Park. 500 people. It was a business women's event. 500 people, and um, it was plastics free. They didn't use any plastics, no throwaways. We have a conference once a year, about 125 people. Uh, we use these baskets. We had breakfast, lunch, and a reception, and we had a bag this big that left the place at the end of the day. Um, so it's making choices about what kinds of food you're serving, um, how to handle those, uh, using reusable cups and things like that. Obviously this is a lunch bag, this is a refillable cup here. Now you raise this issue, so this, is, this will be my last word here. This, uh, a lot of people think this is a wonderful thing. And why is it not a wonderful thing? Okay, the reason is even though it's, it claims it's compostable, um, you know, we're doing the right thing, recycle it, right? So it's not compostable. You know why? Because you can't, there is no composting facility in New Jersey to take it to. Um, so therefore it's not compostable. It's going to end up in the landfill or an incinerator. Um, it's also three times more money than buying, you know, that, that regular cheap, you know, paper, white paper plate you get <laughs> at the supermarket. Um, so actually this is more impactful. Um, because it's got all this stuff. Some of them have little fancy metal things on them, so it makes it even harder. So my thing is, we want to get away from all single-use disposables. So when you go in a restaurant, say no straw, please. If they ask, you know, they offer you a bag, say no, I can take my takeout container without a bag. Um, don't take all those little tiny things, you know, the soy sauce things, if you're going home and you have soy sauce at home anyway. <laughs> you know, all these kinds of things. Use a napkin dispenser for a single pull, um, saves a lot. And we've done this work with restaurants, I'm going to stop here as I pack up. Um, we've done work with restaurants and we've actually saved them anywhere from three to $7,000 just on making changes with their in-eating situation, not even with their takeout. And so we can save businesses money as well as make a difference for the environment and what goes into our rivers, streams, and waterways. And um, takeout containers are the largest contributor of the beach cleanup that you were just at, one of the largest contributors to those beach cleanup cleanups is all this takeout stuff. So um, we could really make a difference. So if anybody's interested, it's rethinkdisposable.org and there's information right there. I'm going to stop. Thank you. He is a 1999 graduate of the first Master Gardener class given in Monmouth County. Since then, he's gone on to achieve the titles of Master Composter, Rain Garden Specialist, Rain Garden Specialist Trainer, and Rain Barrel Workshop Instructor. 
Tom has given many workshops on composting rain gardens and rain barrels throughout New Jersey. He graduated from Rutgers University with a BA and has also earned credits toward an MBA from Monmouth University. In 2001, Tom and his business partners started an alternative energy company located in New Jersey, which specializes in solar, electric, solar, hot water panels, geothermal, and high-performance HVAC systems for residential and commercial properties. This company has installed hundreds of systems throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So Tom, are you doing? Um, a projector? No. Okay. So we no, don't need the lights on. I don't need to show and tell either. <laughs> We're really loving it. We have to use our imaginations and the little gray matter. We can do theater puppets. <laughs> so, um, so we're talking about uh, rain gardens today, and we sort of hit on some of that early on with uh, Michelle's talk about rain gardens as helping in uh, storm water runoff. Uh, before I do this, I just want to give a little background on the Master Gardener program. Uh, 1999 was the first Master Gardener program in Monmouth County in New Jersey. Uh, there were other counties that had the Master Gardener program before that. Uh, we're all volunteers. We go through the training program through Rutgers University, through the county, uh, working with Brookdale also. And uh, we get intense training. I mean, more than anybody can take in. It's just too much. You, get, you have to know insects and uh, plants and all kinds of issues. So you get a smattering, a smattering of things that we learn. We get a couple of master clubs and, and deal with listening also. And, uh, and what we do is we go out uh, like today uh, for volunteer. We have to do so many volunteer hours per year to maintain the status of the uh, uh, of the title of Master Gardener. Uh, we have to do a helpline, people call in with questions. We have to try to answer those questions when they call in. And um, this community service that we're doing now. Uh, so I, I've been specializing in rain barrels, building rain barrels, workshops. Um, the rain gardens actually, you know, going out and designing, helping others to, to build them. And that's something that Ocean Township might be able to use our facilities for. And um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, composting, my favorite. <laughs> so I specialize in composting also. So uh, I give a lot of talks on that. And. Uh, so uh, that, that's basically, I mean, we, we graduate about 30 people per year, so we're just finishing up the training of the 2017. Those people will be graduating in the next couple of weeks, and beginning of the year we'll be uh, working on the 2018 class uh, to go through their training for graduation at the end of the year. So we, we bring in about 30 uh, master graduates per year to go through the program. And as with any program, any group, people come in, they go out, things change. So there's always a flow of people coming in and out. So um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I know we're short on time, so I sort of figured I'd just sort of freewheel this thing. Uh, basically, I, I do workshops, hands-on workshops with people, towns, uh, churches, and uh, for Ocean Township, you may want to reach out uh, to some churches, I, I think, uh, Michelle said that also in the talk, and uh, get a congregation together, and maybe, maybe build some rain gardens for the churches. We just finished one in Mama Beach at the, the Church of Precious Blood, and it turned out very nice. So uh, that's another thing that we could possibly be doing in Ocean Township. Uh, I want to mention something about Rutgers University. Uh, I did graduate from the school. I'm proud to be part of it. Uh, there's 10 oldest colleges in the United States these colleges were, were established before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, 1776. These colleges were up and running before that. And uh, we know the Ivy League colleges, some of them. All right? Some of them? Anybody? Harvard, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stockton, Brown, Anyone you? No. Columbia. 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 Colum
Yeah. Okay. Cornell, no. Yeah. But he didn't have a great basketball program. <laughs> okay. Well, these before 1776. So we missed one important one. But what theory is coming out? What case was in the 1980s? No, uh, that was before it said it was. It's in the 90s Lee, but it was uh, established by two. Okay. Yeah. okay. Queens College was established. And they just celebrated his 250th birthday in 2016. And guess who was there giving the commencement speech? You. Anybody remember? Obama. Obama. Oh. Yeah, he came in to New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about rain gardens. Anybody know the difference between a rain garden and any other garden with flowers and plants? What could be the difference? Well, I know that in the house I lived in before I moved there here, my daughter helped me put in a rain garden. Oh, that's and it was in Union County, and they were very big on it up there. And it, it very much ties into the pervious and impervious. It helps to get the water perking down in so that it's not just running off. Good. Good. So, so the big difference between a regular garden and your plant, your regular garden usually is level with your surrounding lawn or whatever, or maybe even a raised bed. The difference between the rain garden is it's the same, you could be using the same type of plants, but it's got a shallow depression. And that shallow depression is there for a purpose, and that's to catch storm water runoff. To get it, hold it, and let it percolate through down to the uh, groundwater. And as it percolates, it purifies itself. So that's the big difference uh, between the rain garden and a typical typical garden that you put around your property. You can use the same plants. Uh, some of the plants might be a little bit different, and we'll get into that a little bit. So uh, I have my notes here, so I'm going to have to be a bit big. So what are the benefits of the rain garden? It's going to intercept the water. It's going to filter the water, let it flow down, and go back into the groundwater. Pure, pure water. Um, as uh, Michelle pointed out, even if you have a lawn and the water is going on the lawn, it doesn't go into the lawn. It takes a little bit and then the rest it calls it sheet. It just goes right off. Well, if you see a heavy rain, that water will just wash right over that lawn, go right out to the steep curb, out into the streets, pick up all the pollutants, cigarette parts, whatever is out there, and bring them down and put them in the waterways. So we're trying to capture all of that. So uh, the science of the garden is nothing more than soil absorption. So the soil will absorb pollutants. The plants themselves will absorb some pollutants and nutritions, uh, nu nutrients, and take that up into the into the own plants. So that's that's pretty much uh, what's what's there. Uh, the sunlight will kill the pathogens, so as we're holding the water, any pathogens in the water, the sun beating on that water will kill the pathogens, dry them out. So that's all happening in this rain garden. Uh, the parts of a rain garden will have, if you have a grassy area, and you want to put your rain garden in this particular area, and we'll talk about where that garden should be situated. But we're going to remove the grass from that area and dig down and make that depression. So uh, we're going to have a grass barrier, a buffer around the outside of it. We'll have a shallow depression. Uh, we'll have a slope. We'll have what we call a ponding area, which is going to be a level area at the bottom with our mulch and sand if we need it to amend the soil. And our plants will be down there. So, uh, uh, and then our plants themselves will be part of the garden. So we've got a sloping area, we have a ponding area, and we like to plant different types of plants throughout that whole rain garden area. Now, uh, Michelle talked about the uh, average rainfall in New Jersey. Anybody remember what the average rainfall was? 44. Oh, who said that? Oh, okay. 
<laughs> 44 inches, yeah. The average rainfall in New Jersey, 44 inches of rain. And 90% uh, 90, 90 of the rain events for the year are about an inch and a quarter or less. And that's the average uh, in New Jersey. So if you do a quick math on that, 90% uh, of the rainfall times the 44 inches for the year uh, comes out to about 3.3 feet of water for the year. And uh, if we had a thousand square foot area that we, of an impervious area that we're gonna drain into our rain garden, we take that 1,000 times 3.3, it comes out to 3,300 cubic feet of water, which equates to about 25,000 gallons of water. So one rain garden can, can pretty much pull in about 25,000, a small one, 25,000 gallons of water. And if we had 40 of these units scattered about throughout areas in Monmouth County, you're talking a million gallons. Well, not, I mean, you mentioned billions of gallons, so this would be a million gallons. There's just uh, maybe 40 uh, rain guns scattered about. Now, we have more than 40. Yeah, I've been involved in 20 myself, just building uh, uh, rain guns at homes and at uh, public spaces. Uh, so uh, it can make an impact and get that water back into the aquifers where it belongs and pure and clean and not into the rivers and waterways. So uh, how do we install the rain garden? Uh, three steps, the uh, planning, the installation, and the maintenance. So the planning is you've got to determine where you want that uh, garden to go. Uh, I'm just looking out here at, at when I pulled into the parking lot. And we, I think she put, uh, Michelle talked about that, maybe a rain garden down a little bit. Because you can see the slope is dry. You go out later on, the slope is dry and it's down. And that was just going to wash right off this parking space, down to the, to the what was it? Yeah. 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 So if you put a rain garden or, or rain gardens down along that fence line, and I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction or not. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's right behind you. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, if we had a rain garden there between the parking lot and Deal Road, mm -hmm. and I think there's a big grassy area. Yes, it's rough. It's a trench out there, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And where does it go? It's going into the trench and then out somewhere else. It's the neighbors. Yeah. The neighbors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this might be an ideal spot. And I think she mentioned that also, that, that, that might have been on the list. So, uh, so we've got the planning, the uh, installation, and the maintenance. So uh, the planning part is I identify the spot that we want to put it, whether it's part of your home, whether it's part of the library, whether it's part of some church somewhere. Identify and see if it's going to work for us. Uh, visit the site, it's on your own property, you don't have to visit it. If it's here, we visit the site and come out and look and see what we can do with it. Uh, we, we do some design calculations which are not really too deep, it's just a, a matter of some light uh, multiplication. And uh, some of the things we have to be careful of, we want to keep any garden that we plant, any rain garden, about 10 feet away from the foundation of the structure, from the home or the building. We don't want water backing up and maybe going into the foundation of that particular property. So 10 feet away or more. Never over a septic system. I don't think we have any septic systems in the ocean anyway. We probably all sewage. And uh, try to avoid tree roots because that's just tough to dig around. That's all. So that's all part of the design. Uh, now we have to identify the drainage area. So let's again use this, this uh, location. The drainage area would be uh, the parking lot. Now, the whole parking lot, we put one little garden over in one spot. We can only measure what we think is going to flow from that, that one parking area to that area. So we would measure that, that parking area, come up with square footage, and through uh, some measurements uh, determine what the slope is, 
going from the highest part to the lowest part where the garden will be. And based on those measurements, we can determine how deep and how big that garden should be. So it's kind of scientific, but not really deeply involved. So we can determine how big that would have to be to, to capture most of that rainwater coming in with that parking lot. And all of this information, I have some handouts, by the way, right here, so uh, after the talk, uh, if you want to grab one. And also, Rutgers University has fact sheets on all of this information, so you just go to Rutgers uh, ed, 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 uh, backslash fact sheets, and they give you all that information that you possibly need on rain gardens. And the handouts have some really good, good uh, websites to go to also. So uh, we're going to measure the, the, that, the impervious area with the size of that driveway, uh, do our slope uh, calculation, and determine what size garden we'll need. And basically, uh, a 500 square foot area, uh, we would need a 100 square foot uh, garden, which is about 10 by 10, at 6 inches deep. And then they give a bunch of different numbers, but basically 100 square foot, 6 inches deep would, would handle a 500 square foot impervious area, whether it be a driveway, a parking lot, or a roof from your home. So talking about the, your home, so you, if you want to put water by your home, where the downspout comes down, whether that downspout runs onto the lawn, whether the downspout runs out to uh, your driveway, we may be able to redirect that downspout from the driveway to the rain garden and uh, you'll build your rain garden in that area. You'll roughly measure your roof. You can do that with uh, uh, Google search. You know, you get the aerial view and you can pretty much just measure that out. It doesn't have to be accurate. So you just want to get a rough idea of how many square foot area of roof area. Once you have that, you determine the slope and you determine how deep you have to be and how big it's going to be to uh, capture that rainwater coming off your own home. Before, before you do any digging on your property, whether you're going to put in a rain garden or whether you're going to put a post hole in for your favorite light to light your driveway, there's a one number to call. Anybody, everybody, any? But yes. yes. well, I know the guys are that big. <laughs> <laughs> they know they can learn. You got to do it. But it's a one number call. It's one eight hundred two seven two one thousand or eight eleven, e either one. And uh, it's, it's a free of charge call. What you have to do is mark out in white, either paint or, or, or banani or anything. <laughs> anything. You know, I'm going to take from this point to here. I'm going to put a white stripe or something. Here. So this way, when the mark out people come out, they see that white mark and they say, wait a minute, there's an electric line right here. Uh, you can't do that. So they'll put a red mark right where your white mark is telling you do not dig there. Uh, each one is color coded. Gas has uh, yellow, electric has red, water has blue. So all of these are marked out for you. So if you do dig after the mark out and you hit something, it's not your responsibility. It's that they mismarked it. If you dig and you didn't call and you hit something, you're paying for it. So uh, make sure you call. It's free, free of charge. And any, any kind of thing. You know, they don't go uh, to a stores and the sprinkler system. That's, that's your responsibility. So very important. No matter what you're doing on your property or anywhere where you're digging, even your contract, you've got to tell them to do that. Uh, the next thing we want to do for uh, a rain garden here or a rain garden at your home is to do a percolation test. Now what, what I mean by this is you're going to dig a hole about a foot deep uh, about six inches around. And you're going to fill that hole with water and let that water soak through so now that ground in that hole is saturated. Now you're going to fill that up again. So you're going to fill that up with a one foot hole again with water and you're going to see how long it takes for that water to disappear in that hole. If it stays there more than 24 hours, you don't want to put a rain gun there because you've got poor, so, uh, okay. uh, drain <laughs> you have poor drainage there. Uh, if it goes down pretty quickly, it looks like a good location. If it's the only place you can do it, then what you have to do is amend the soil. 
If you're going to have to dig down deeper, uh, put in sand, it's going to be a lot more work and a lot more costly to do that. So, um, so do that percolation test. And again, if it takes more than 24 hours, either go to another location or be ready to do a bigger dig. Uh, a soil test. Uh, Rutgers University will do a soil test. RCE building, I know the RCE building is. Uh, 400 or 4,000 clocks be road in freehold. Yeah. Well, it's the Rutgers block of the extension building there. If you bring your soil in, they'll do a pH test free. Just a pH test. If you want more information on the soil at your home or wherever you want that, P, uh, that soil test done, they'll give you a kit. It's nothing more than a bag that you fill up with, with the uh, area that you're working in. And uh, where you want to do a spot, let's say I want to plant this whole area, I'm going to take some soil from different sections, put, mix it, put it in the bag, and ship it off to Rutgers University, charge about, I think, $20. Mm -hmm. Is it $20? Yeah. yeah. Uh, $20, uh, you ship it out, and within a week, they're going to send back a full description of what you have in the soil for whatever you're planning on doing. You may want to put vegetables here, so that report is going to be different than if you were going to put grass in this area. So they're going to, you tell them to put grass, they'll tell you to put more lime down. If you tell them you're going to put tomatoes here, they'll tell you to put uh, less lime down or some other ingredient that can have been in the soil. With. So it's worth $20 to do that. But the pH test is free. Or you can send away the kits. They have kits that will do pH testing for you. You know, you get a couple of drops, you put it on your soil, and it'll tell you whether this is city or not. So, they're available for you, not too expensive. Uh, take photos of what you're doing. It's always uh, nice to have photos if you start to finish. Uh, soil amendment, uh, fertilizers, you might have to add. After the soil test comes back, to let you know what you have to put in as far as that. Uh, compost, a low compost, yes, five minutes. I'm only up to page 22. That's <laughs> five hundred, that's all. Oh, there's just too much to talk about. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, the bottom line of this whole thing is, it's, uh, it's work to be done, we can either do it Again, we're volunteers, we come out, we do not, we're not supposed to do the work for you, but we can guide. If you want to uh, get something going, either here or the church or somewhere, uh, we'll come out, we'll help, we'll help with the design of it, uh, we'll do, you know, help with the layout of it, we'll give you some ideas of what plants you can put in so that you can get started doing some of this work and uh, getting to where, uh, uh, Michelle was saying earlier on that, uh, and that was really a, an interesting uh, layout where they had all that work showing you what you can do in certain areas of the aerial views. So that can be done in the ocean. And uh, I will spread the word also as I do more of these talks about other, uh, other towns also to get involved in this. And one town is really great is, is Keyport. Anybody know Keyport over there? Mm -hmm. well, it, it, well, you need people that are really interested in doing something. And they got a couple of people over there, Nancy and uh, Ed Carew. Um, and they're in the environmental committee. They did rain gardens. They did uh, rain barrel builds. They're doing composting for the town. I mean, they're really deeply involved. The town's behind them, and uh, they're doing wonderful things. So it's like a town that's showing the way for other towns of what we can do to save water from going through the waterways, the composting that we talked about earlier. In the end, uh, so a lot of good stuff going on. And since you cut me off at page 22, I have to speak more <laughs> Right. Are there any um, rain gardens around here that we could look at? Uh, Mother Beach, we just finished. No, it's pretty close. Asbury the Park. Church of uh, Precious Blood, Asbury Park. Uh, wait, where is it? Asbury? Is it the train station? I think it's at the train station. Train station. Yeah, okay. Uh, That's a nice one, too, Marsha. Yeah. Uh, look at. Uh, uh, Union Beach. I guess the, the walkway is, is when it's raining. 
just to see. Well, it's a good time to see them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of yeah. Them capturing the yeah the runoff. And they look pretty. I mean, they're really aesthetically you know pleasing. It looks like a regular garden, and it's uh, it's really a way to go. And especially the one in Union Beach is right by the, uh, the I guess that's the bay right there. So it's right, right by the new wall where they put in the rain gardens right there, right before it goes into the bay. So it's, uh, yeah. So. That's your, that's Keyport? Uh, you mean the beach? Oh, no. Keyport. Keyport. Oh, it is. It is Keyport. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I was. I, I would love to do a garden. I'm doing all new landscaping now. Is there someone I could just call to come take a look at my property? Uh, we really, really don't get involved with the home. We try to stay away with the home, but there was really good information. Um, yeah. So it's not really anyone locally doing rain gardens on or presidentially. Uh, are you local or? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll do Oh, right. She lives across the street. She's not able to get the run over from oh. <laughs> After this, I'll walk over. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're not going to go take a quick look and yeah. see this. Very nice. 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 Yeah, we try not to. Uh, I'm going on the industrial side, commercial side, with institutions. We'll do that. Uh, the biggest problem we find is that once we do a bigger project, let's say we do this, who maintains it? Who right. takes care of it? We're not going to come in and do that. Right. No. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, homeowner, we are homeowners will take care of it. Right. Right. Yes. But what I'm saying is, like we did uh, Brookdale College, we did a couple of big ones up there, and now they just covered with weeds because nobody's taking care of them. That's. I'm walking Joe Pelea Park, and there's a big fenced in the area that says Ocean Township Rain Garden. <laughs> To adopt it. Yeah, one of the slides showed the uh, Eagle Scout project. I forget who's squad. Recently, they were just awarded right at the town meeting for the Eagle Scouts. Like, oh, there's some handouts here also on the rain box if you like. I'm sure it's that always. Our next and final speaker is Laurel Montherrette. Laurel is our recent and former chairperson of the Ocean Township Shade Tree Commission. She's certified in landscape design from the New York Botanical Garden and the Association of Professional Landscape Designers. She's going to talk to us about the important relationship between trees and helping manage water. Thank you, Laura. So how many people love trees? Oh, we <laughs> If you haven't read this book, this is a great book called The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, written by a guy from Germany who maintains a forest out there. And um, I like this book very much, especially because he raises questions that you may not have thought of. For instance, how does water get onto land? It rains. Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, because land is higher than water, water runs down, so how, yeah, it rains. Well, but it rises up into the clouds. Yeah, well, and then the clouds open and it comes down. Okay, so, so that's uh, true. Uh, the trees. The source of the uh, clouds oh, is the ocean. Okay, now 400 miles from the coast, we don't have oceans, we don't have clouds. What because of rain in this? 400 miles from the coast. The wind that carries the clouds. From the they dissipate by 400 miles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I learned from this book, trees the cause of rain uh, inland. The uh, evapotranspiration of their canopies. There's 27 square yards of leaves and needles per square yard of forest, and there's 8.5 cubic yards of water per square mile that trees use in summer that is released into the air. Now, if coastal forests are cut down, this whole link gets ruined. <laughs> So we may not think we care about the inland areas because we're on the coast, we get plenty of rain. But we are the ones who need to support the forests here. Um, so therefore, here's a little thought for you. 
without trees, there is no rain. Just think in terms of England, right? Mm -hmm. Without rain, there are no floods, right? But there's no water. Well, but I'm just following. I'm sorry. So therefore, without trees, there would be no floods, right? No. Right. Yay, yeah. Nothing. Without trees, there would be no floods inland, right? Because there would be no water. Um, so does that mean we should get rid of trees? Well, there would be no water. They were right. And so it would be desertification. We would change the inland to desert. And that's what's happening in studies they've done, like for instance in Brazil, where they've cut down the coastal forest. The Amazon is drying up. And that's what happened in our southwest, that we used to have a lot more lushness there. Um, they know it from tree rings. But now, it's uh, the Chihuahuan and Sonoran deserts have, have migrated north due to the way that we've used the land, cut down the forest. Albuquerque, owl blue is white, Kerki is oak. Albuquerque used to be having lots of white oaks. Now it's a desert. Um, so, okay, so we, we agree that we don't want to have deserts. So, now we're back on the coast. How do trees mitigate the rainfall that we do have? Um, this is where trees benefit us. Um, they're like sponges. Because if you consider that the um, litter, we call it litter, and that's really too bad because litter implies garbage. And litter is really uh, what is needed to create this sponge effect. And uh, another book that's very, very good is Roots Demystified. It talks about um, the fact that roots, tree roots grow up into this litter. There's a lot more air, there's nutrient uptake is better. And um, so if we don't have duff under our trees, we don't have infiltration. Uh, is it Michelle was talking about grass, you know, turf grass and suburban lawns that mm -hmm. it's, you know, you, you mow the lawn, you compact the soil, um, you know, you use chemicals to kill the white in the soil. Um, you break up every leaf that's falling. Right, so there's no duff. And so um, uh, this is, I think, an important idea that, that, yeah, we can have a little circle of mulch around our trees, but that really doesn't create the huge area that trees really need to grow in. Um, that it has an impact on the way we design our properties, for instance. We could be a lot more um, helpful in getting infiltration into the land by uh, creating more uh, areas of natural uh, shrubs and trees in our, our properties. But, okay, so, and in fact, one of my friends had a tree area, a lot of oaks in her backyard, and her husband is a neat nick, and he wanted everything cleared out. So they took all that, all those years of duff and put them on the street. She had water in her basement for the first time in years after that, because it wasn't being absorbed. Um, trees uh, prevent erosion when it rains uh, by intercepting and slowing the fall of raindrops by their canopies. And they um, modify the temperature, it's a lot cooler under trees due to the tra transpiration of the uh, leaves. They filter and remove pollutants, um, and they lower costs for treating drinking water because uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, forests provide the drinking water sources. Um, and so if you have pure water to begin with, you don't have to spend as much money treating it. Um, so basically, um, I looked into the uh, idea of, well, if trees, you know, we're so concerned about flooding, do trees, uh, does plant, wholesale planting of trees on, for instance, cleared land that's been used for uh, agriculture or pasture, uh, you know, like they were um, doing in uh, England, for instance. They used to, England and Scotland used to be forested before the Navy cut down a lot of trees and uh, they, you know, made pastures for sheep. Um, and there's 
try to reforest that area and then asking the question, will that help prevent downstream flooding by having lots of trees? And that's a, something that hasn't been proven yet. They don't have enough data from long-term studies to know whether that will have an effect downstream or not. Um, but, uh, you know, China is trying to prevent the advance of the Gobi Desert um, by doing a lot of tree planting. So, you know, whether they can reverse the effects of uh, drying out uh, the land from desert uh, conversion is, is also a question. Um, but that, that, those are some of the ideas. Uh, and, you know, trees are very beneficial uh, for the, you know, as you mentioned, the, uh, uh, most of the rain events are small in, in our climate. So we don't have these huge flooding uh, events like they did in Houston so much. We have more gentle rains, and that's where <coughs> trees really can help um, with the slowing down of the water. Um, from the sky and keep it from getting into the streams and, and um, washing away the sediments. Because the faster water goes, the more it takes with it. In China, a lot of the trees are going in there also for air pollution to right. absorb some of the pollution. And there you go. Because we were there the last year and uh, big, big movement on, on the tree. Right. Right. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, so it's carbon. So right? it's are you suggesting that, like my lawn people come at the end of the year and do that cleanup? I should skip the cleanup and let the leaves that are there just lie? Would that be uh, advantageous for the lawn? Well, for the lawn, uh, <coughs> the lawn probably would appreciate you. A lot of people grinding up the leaves so that they turn into you know compost sooner. But they could certainly mow um, the leaves uh, into the grass and we decompose. Well, they, they, the they just rake them usually at the end of the season. I know, I know. But they should mulch them. They shouldn't just yeah. kill the grass. Right, the grass wouldn't like to be covered with leaves, but you could get them. You could. Um, mulch them into the grass, or you could use uh, a mulching mower to bag, bag the chopped up leaves and put them on your beds wherever you have them. That, that's something that maybe would be good to develop more in suburban areas so that we wouldn't be considered urban anymore. <laughs> I'm amazed how everybody puts out leaves and, and grass clippings at the curb. Yeah. I, I give nothing of that away. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at my place, it doesn't look like there's, there's piles and piles. It's, it disappears. <coughs> there's a, 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 a thing called Love em and Leave Them, mm -hmm. a website where they talk about, um, you know, handling uh, leaf fall in different ways that are beneficial rather than putting them on the street. I, I would be curious to know how, how our town um, would benefit from um, encouraging residents to recycle their leaves on site versus having the trucks pick them up and put them in the field test site, but then do they sell the compost that results to contractors? I don't know. And put them down in piles wow. over in Joe Play Park. Yeah. And you can see people like now and in the spring go over and, and shovel it into barrels and bring it home. Yeah, I used to do that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't know whether, um, I mean, there's so many leaves, I don't know whether they sell the compost to um, other places. Well, I thought they put it all out, I don't know. Yeah. But that's what's so goofy about it. As he points out, you know, people rake it, push it to the curb, the truck picks it up, takes it to a compost area, the people that put it out of the curb drive to the compost area to right. get the leaves and get the compost and bring it back. <laughs> Yeah, you know. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's yeah. one of the things that, that, uh, that I've noticed that kind of bothers me is people carry what it was usually a, a kind of a truck pulls up and mows everything and, so and then blows it into the street. <laughs> and I've seen them blowing it into the drains. Yeah. And I'm saying, why? Because that just floods it out to the so ocean or whatever. Yeah. It's lost. Yeah. And, and by the way, why in the drain? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if they, if they use chemicals, if that's all getting into the water, it goes into the ocean anyway, downstream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But do we have to do that? Yeah. So. There are some kinds of venting that actually the blowers 
commercial blowers. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just for that. Idea. Plus, you get any pollutants in the air, and, uh, and, uh, especially in the springtime. With the and you're getting uh, oil and stuff off the yeah. roadway as you're doing that. So. Well, I know that <coughs> when I talked to uh, one of the t um, school officials uh, years ago about putting more trees on school properties, they, they didn't want them because they were too messy. They had too many leaves to bother with. So, I mean, changing our attitude about leaves is uh, <laughs> inherent in changing our attitude about trees. Well, one other thing you should add to your talk is the mulch that's built up two, three feet on the trunk of a tree. Oh, that yeah. we cannot do that. They should yeah. not be doing that. Right. No You've talked about that in the past, Laurel, no volcanoes around yeah. your tree. Yeah, Don't that's the worst thing for a tree. Any more? Yeah, fill it. Suggestion that you might uh, ask the uh, mayor in his next newsletter to put in a little thing. If you don't want, if you want your own mulch or compost, don't put the leaves on the curb. Just suggest that because people, you know, I never thought of that. This rotating, you take it, I take it back and forth and all this stuff. Yeah, maybe see if you can put a little item in the uh, newsletter. Yeah, good idea. It is. I the, the latest newsletter had a history of Ocean Town, a lot of historical stuff. Very, very interesting. <coughs> I wonder how many people read it. But it's also a bit of every home, every taxpayer. Right. And if they know how to deal with some of this stuff, maybe it would change attitudes. Yeah. I, I would support what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I never read these. I just mold it. Mm -hmm. I mold it over the, if it's on the driveway, I mold it. It blows it to a place where I can suck it up into a bag. And then I dump the bag in the compost. Yeah. In the backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's all I have. And I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that concludes our presentations. And I'm going to open it up now. Maybe the presenters would come up so that you can all answer questions. And I'm introducing one other person. Um, we have a, a person here from the Ocean Township Sewerage Authority, Chuck Theodora, who offered to come up and participate if you have any questions about our sewerage treatment. Well, I have a question for uh, babies. Oh, yes. Um, I had been composting my kids' kitchen scraps until we had raccoons, and I thought maybe I should stop uh, because our compost was open. Um, so now I'm putting them all down the disposal, and I feel a little guilty about that. Am I directing you to feeling guilty? Yeah, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you're doing everything with the best of intention, right? But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, you know, there are um, backyard compost. I mean, a lot of what Monmouth County has used in the past is these earth machines. You know, these if you don't want to use an open one, having problems. I actually have, I live in Red Bank, and you wouldn't think, but we have possums, skunks, raccoons, groundhogs, and um, you could get like an earth machine kind of, it's plastic, it is plastic, it's very durable. I had one for like 20 years before I had finally replaced it, but some of them also have, um, for urban areas, like in the north or here, they have, um, they call them rat bottoms because they're, you know, to control rats, but they control any kind of rodent from kind of getting into it. So if you, you know, if you have a problem and you can't figure out a way to control it with an open, uh, compost. There are pretty low cost Earth, options. Earth machine? It's called the Earth Machine. Monmouth County might actually um, offer them. They have these um, Earth Machine sales they do a couple of times a year. You might just call the, the um, solid waste program at Monmouth County and see it. Ask if they have um, I don't I don't use the bottom on mine and I'm fine. I, I don't seem to have any coming into it, so, but don't put it down drain. What's wrong with ground up foodstuffs being in the sewer system? Well, because it adds a lot of nutrients. Food, yeah, so, you know, right. you don't want to be adding nutrients to water. It creates algae blooms, and then when you create algae, it's like fertilizer. It's like, that's why we're restricting fertilizers. So you you think less potent. Bad. Yeah. Right. It's not poisonous, but it it's not poisonous, but it's not necessary. It's better off composting it. Right. And put it into your And it puts it to a good purpose, right? Because right. it puts it to a good purpose where 
And the sewer system, all you're doing is wasting it. But it's, it's, it's similar, you know, to poop and whatnot, right? Yes. It's decomposed. But it would be a lot easier to com compost it. It would be a lot better. Also, the greases, the fats, the oils, they actually rise and float on, and it's actually taken off, and then taken off site and disposed of where you can mm -hmm. compost something like that, and it would be better off. The uh, earth machine just stepped back a mm -hmm. bit on that one. Uh, the county is selling that earth machine for $35. Mm -hmm. If you go to Home Depot, that same unit is $99. Wow. So the, the county is subsidizing that because they want more people mm -hmm. like you, me, and everybody else to compost instead of not knowing what to do with it. Right. And I put my... So it's a my, good idea. Uh, like my garden stuff or my, you know, the stuff that I'm pulling, you know, my lawn related stuff. I don't have a very big lawn, but that I had an open, but I put my food in the earth machine. And I'm a really lazy co composter, so I'm almost never emptying, emptying my compost bin. And we compost everything. You know, we, have, you know, we don't do the, the meats and the greases. You don't want to put that in a composter, but. I have a question that's slightly not related, but it is related to water. We didn't touch on um, weed killers, you know, chemicals in the garden, but I'm a very avid gardener, and I don't use, or I try not to use anything but the um, only, only, or however you say it, uh, safe sprays and, and things for my garden. But I have one problem way in the back of my backyard, way in the back, it's a small backyard, and it backs on a pond, which comp compounds the problem. Poison ivy. Mm -hmm. I can go out and pull up all the other weeds, and I can put down ground cover um, around the vegetables, so I don't have to weed all the time. I can't touch the poison ivy, even, I mean, don't just tell me wear gloves because if I go near that stuff, I was in the hospital once with poison ivy. Is there any way? I tried spraying the <laughs> filter. You're supposed to be good for everything. It yeah. just sort of laughed at me. Yeah, it's a pretty Is there anything hole. I can do? And this is a pond that has fish and ducks and geese mm -hmm. and frogs. I mean, I, I can't go killing all of those things. I. I'm not going to go near my compost until I figure out how to solve this one. I would it's going bring in a professional, look, uh, uh, bring in somebody else, and yeah. you tell them, you know, it's poison ivy, you know, wave gloves, but you really got to get the root system out of there. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, here's the problem. And even in the winter time, it's still dangerous if you're allergic to it. The problem is, it's coming over from my neighbor's backyard. So I get more, but the sun comes more in my yard, and so it comes over into my yard to grow. But I, I don't think I could send a professional over to her yard. So well, then why don't you try and talk to, if you can, talk to your neighbor and see if you can. Share. share do a share cost or you know if they have neighbors answer with a smile on her face good luck <laughs> oh no 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 you have to dig it up and get it out, and you yes. have to get at the root. Otherwise, it's kind of like bamboo. You know, people call it crazy bamboo, and, and it's just you know, it's totally invasive. Yeah, goes on vacation. <laughs> yeah, it's totally invasive. But I, I don't want you to don't endanger yourself. It's really I have a sister-in-law gets violently ill from it. So yeah, you yeah. can't. So if you can avoid it, the problem is maybe you should move your compost bin. <laughs> And so that you're not in contact with it, and if it's a if it's something you can sort of tolerate, it's not creeping into your yard. It sort of stays in this one spot. Then just maybe your solution is to move the compost bin so you can enjoy using it. And just like around that, that's your spot. Right. It, it, I mean, if it's yeah, if it's not moving, it's sort of staying in one place. Then maybe that's your remedy. I've done that with the squirrels. I'll try it with the poison right. ivy. The other is, would it work for? It's kind of like. A, a, creating a container, can you sort of go below ground? Like with bamboo, you know, if you create a barrier, or even, you know, when you're when you're doing a 
trying to keep rodents out of your garden, right? If you create a barrier underground, will the roots still go under? It depends or, on. Or will it stay, you know, will the roots just stay on the other side? Yeah. Maybe, uh, like a six, they, they sell, they actually sell edgy material, and that's a good, good idea to use yeah. that. It's about six to nine inches. Mm -hmm. So you dig a uh, trench and you drop that in so the root system hits that plastic barrier, if you will, and uh, for a Oh, yeah. That's another. It'll still be there. Just move that compost and <laughs> let it be over there. But if you want to contain it, doing doing an uh, edge barrier, go as deep as you can go. Okay. The tree roots, uh, you can't do that. No. Yeah. yeah so I think we'll just. just. But thank you very much. Yeah. Now there was another question back here. Well, I'll, uh, this isn't really water, but do each does each town have a place? The town doesn't sign up with the water company to say you service our town, or do they? Not not presently. Uh, like the, at some point in the past, we either either acquired the system or just served it because there was no other service there. Um, but there, there are instances where towns say, oh, like we, we want to enter into an agreement and have you manage the water system or sell the water system or just have it be operated by uh, um, a water company or a, a purveyor. Uh, also, I was thinking on the map, you had a, a, your service area and then there was a white, like the enemy territory or the competitors and then there's somebody else you have to get to. You just put the border lines wherever you want, or you have to get permission from the town. Um, and the no, I mean, and some of those areas are white just because there's no public water service in that area. Okay. Uh, it's not, there's areas that, that don't have water mains on the streets. I'm they, thinking they of like PSA, you know, that's electric and gas, but I forget what the Northern Water Companies are called, because I used to live up there, but I forgot. But, um, but uh, the, the, the service area is is set in our, in our tariff with the Board of Public Utilities. Right. So we have an area that, that we are chartered to serve in, okay. and that's that's kind of our sandbox. Of but you can't go and try to like say to some town, we want to do your water now, because you wouldn't have the pipes, you'd have to put all your own pipes in and all that kind of um, stuff. It, it really depends if, it, if the town is in our service area, like no, in our right. charter area. They weren't. Right. You, you can't just go someplace else as a, a retail person. Well, we're going to put a store up here now, we're going to put a store over here. No, no, not okay. without, not without okay. some kind of agreement with, okay. with, uh, with the municipality. Okay. Unless there's no service, right. and then it's, then it's, then you, Compete um, with other people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If there are townships that are serviced by a public utility, the township would have to put out a request for proposals right. and do evaluation of the system, mm -hmm. and then it would go through a ballot. Well, it's supposed to go through a ballot question where the voters of every township have a right to vote on the sale of the water system. Um, now, there's a law that was passed called the Water Infrastructure Protection Act, which actually um, fast tracks that voting process and leaves it in the hands of a of your city government instead of through the ballot process if if the system meets these emergent conditions. Uh, there are five emergent conditions. So if that happens, if the township decides to use this, the rights under the law, the Water Infrastructure Protection Act, uh, the the residents have 45 days to petition the gov the municipal government to put it on a ballot. And if I work in reverse, if they have a private system, they want to join American Water or whatever one, they would have to, you know, gain some interest and then put it on the ballot to do that. I just was interested in how that works. If it's already under a private company, you mean? That if somebody may want to switch, I mean, there has been such situations where, you know, one private company takes over for another, like right. Suez versus United or, you know, New Jersey American, you know, they, they, you know, they have changed and swapped and moved around as to who's controlling a system, and some have gone public to private, and some have, you know, Just have it mixed. Yes. Like my town is mixed. I get half a year as New, New Jersey American, half a year as my municipal water supply. But it's it's my municipal water supply who sends me the bill. It's Red Bank. So every town is very different in how it's set up. Are they all, all of these independent, independent and otherwise, are, are they under the purview of the Public Utilities Commission? Uh, no, um, uh, private water companies are. 
Uh, also, if a municipal system serves outside of its area, then it can, under certain circumstances, fall under the BPU regulation also. Okay. But if it's if it's a municipal system, uh, currently, no. It does not. Are there standards that it has to apply? Is there any kind of a regulation of them to make sure it has clean water, for example, you know, whatever those requirements might be? Of, of a... Of a private, I, private, privately held company. Oh, absolutely. actually, yes. Like, the, the Board of Public Utilities regulates um, us in addition to the D, into the DEP and the EPA. The okay, so ones. you have environmental protection and so forth that get involved in the act right now. Okay, thank you. We actually have more on on being a private company mm -hmm. than than a municipal system does. Okay. Thank you. I had a um, question about the water barrels. Are there? Uh, I think they were mentioned several times. Yeah, first speaker. Is it something? Is it something that's practical mm -hmm. for homeowners to actually put in in terms of? getting somewhat clean water um, to use for non-potable purposes. Yeah, the, the barrels themselves are usually around 55 gallons. I have two of them in my home, so uh, what I do is, when I know there's a rain event going to happen, maybe uh, look at the long range, uh, maybe a week out, it looks like rain is coming, I'll actually pump the water out of the rain barrel. I put a submersible pump in there and I pump out the water and water my plants, especially in the summertime when things need watering almost constantly. So I'll get 100 gallons of water, I'll pump that out to all the different areas in the garden, then wait for the next rain event to fill them up. And they fill up very quickly mm -hmm. if you get a decent rain. So yeah, they are practical. Uh, we do workshops. We were doing them for around $55. That included all the parts mm -hmm. necessary but the rain now is now getting hard at the time, so mm -hmm. that's one of the issues that we have. But yeah, it will definitely make sense. Is it just that it's not popular? But it is popular. It's popular. It's popular. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people are grabbing them and doing that. Yeah. Well, we used to get them in South Jersey for like $10 a barrel and then get the parts and that supplier sort of right. dry up. Yeah. Start well, the barrels. Food, food, food. Yeah, food, food grade. grade barrels. Mm -hmm. and, and does the water need to be treated? No, not really, no. no. Put a screen over it, uh, keep the mosquito or lobby out of there, and uh, pretty much if you use the water, recycle it. Yeah, it, it's, it's not stagnant. No. Right, you also, by putting the screen over in addition to the mosquitoes, it keeps, you know, you're getting runoff from the roof, right? It goes in the drain, and so, you know, if you have a traditional shingles, you get those particles that come off, so it keeps that off because it stays on the screen mm -hmm. for the most part. Again, you're using it for your garden or you're using it for plants, um, you know, and that's perfectly acceptable. If, if you did a submersible pump or something that gave me more pressure, you know, rather than using gravity uh, to have the water sort of trickle out, then, then um, you know, to use for washing something, you, know, you could do that, but you don't need to. And, and the thing is, you want to put a barrel up a little higher. You know, so you could use cinder blocks or something mm -hmm. to have it higher, so you can have the gravity flowing, and it's better to have the water sort of, I don't want to say trickling, but you want it, you want water to go move slowly because then it's going to go into the ground better mm -hmm. rather than like blasting a certain area and, and then it flying all over the place. I have three of them, so. Ooh. We have another question. I, I, I was in two different places this afternoon. I may have missed it, but did you get in to talk about rain gardens? Yes, Okay, I, I missed some of these things, so I apologize. Because that seems to be something that had that has a, a level of popularity a couple of years ago. I haven't heard much about it of late, but you're still promoting that kind of Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of guys are uh, getting involved with that. Okay. And I can add that although you said the maintenance is a requirement for it, that having had a rain garden and having like growing roses in the front of my house it's much easier to maintain the, because you use oh, at least i use native plants mm -hmm. in the rain garden they really didn't take tremendous upkeep compared to i mean i think my roses are dying because i'm really just not up to all the upkeep that they require yeah. the other one kind of itself. 
I will, with a minimal of work, I see. You know, there's like, so we, a small degree of reading, but Laura put in a lot of, she designed a garden with a lot of native plants from where I am now. It's not a rain garden, but it's kind of a native plant garden. And now that it's becoming established, it's stronger than the weeds because it's native to around here. So, you yeah, know, once in a while something grows up and I have to pull it out, but it's not like like the roses. The weeds just mm -hmm. come in and attack the roses. It's different, and I, I, I like that. I have a, my front yard is mostly uh, perennials, you know, as, as native as I can be. I often wonder if the town's going to come and find me for having a little bit more of a wildflower in my, in my front yard. But I would say I have less that I have to mow. I just have a walk, a grass spot that just is basically a pathway to my porch. I'm, you know, I have kind of an urban, small urban house, so I don't have a sprawling yard. But um, you could turn your front yard and, and, and make it into a wildflower. You know, you could have it so it's an oval shape, or you could have it look, you know, nice if you want to. But um, you can put pathways in it. You could put a sitting spot. You can, you know. People do all kinds of things, but I don't have to do much, and the water gets to the gets well, into heard, the ground. The library here seems to have some type of natural garden growth. Yeah. 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 Or some people do a lot of tall grasses, you know. Also, which is another way of because the tall grasses kind of go in clumps. You see a lot of people doing those instead of. You know, sort of actually quite nice in the or ornamental grasses. Yes. Uh -huh. They they clump, they don't uh, get out of control, they have a nice interest through the winter mm -hmm. and with the flower head uh, the uh, feathery heads on them and mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of nice And it gives you room to absorb, you know, so that's another uh, way to look nice. And I think as people create a new aesthetic, you know, the aesthetic became the lawn, right? Mm -hmm. So actually under the stormwater rules in New Jersey, it's considered impervious cover. Mm -hmm. Lawn is considered impervious cover. So it's really living cement. That's what it is. <laughs> so, you know, the more we can dig up, you know, and get rid of that living cement, the better off we are. Just put in your compost pile and turn it into something useful. Uh, it would be a better thing. So um, not everybody, you know, we've been sort of trained a certain way. So we just have to make things attractive so that the neighbor goes, oh, I want to look like that, instead of everybody going, I want to have the perfect lawn. Yeah. And you know those little flags that people have on their lawns, you know, let's say they have pesticides on their lawns, my organization, Clean Water Action, got the law passed that has those flags. And you as a neighbor, you know, have a right to know what they're using, you, you have rights about that, and it also prevents you or your kids, your grandkids, your pets from going on that. You have a choice about whether you're going to walk on that lawn or not, right? But that's all pesticides. Yeah, you know? that's scary. Now this has been so informative today. It's great. I appreciate the, all of you brought here to the table. It's really so amazing. And, um, I've been very active in trying to protect what trees we have left on the corner. And I was very involved in the last um, development. And that was, I don't know where a lot of the people went that were so involved there that it's been hard for me to get a group going. So it's interesting, today during this, it, my phone keeps beeping, I feel vibrating, because there's a whole dialogue going on. I guess somebody just was made aware of what is going on at West mm -hmm. Park and all these trees that have come down. And um, I just learned at the Shady Tree Commission this week about um, you know, there's a study and it's just diminishing and it's really scary and mm -hmm. that our tree canopy, which you're talking about with the trees, that um, we're at this point right now, like I think you said earlier, that we're becoming more of an urban community than suburban. So I'm hoping that maybe, and I mean, it would just be great, we, we have these meetings in town and no one ever shows up to them and they're recorded like this is recorded. But I think we just as a community need to make more noise because we're getting just bullied here. And I heard that Dean's Market, which is a health food um, establishment, just clear, clear cut all these trees on their property. And, and I don't understand because we all have a three tree, like sometimes if you're doing landscaping, we have a maximum of three trees a year. How did these commercial businesses get the okay to just plow down? I don't know if they're expanding or what was their purpose for doing it. A bigger parking lot. And, and sometimes actually they don't have permits to do it. Um, like PNC, when they took down a whole slew of trees, they didn't have a single permit to do it. So don't assume 
that necessarily somebody has a permit or they're doing the right thing. I'm not saying that Deans is doing the wrong thing, right. you know, per the law, but you know, don't don't necessarily assume that somebody, you know, follow all the rules. I just think it'd be nice if more people in the community could hear all of you experts. They are then hopefully tune in. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to I'm just I'm putting signs on my lawn now to just get people to show up at the meeting. So I guess if there's any time there's always the public portion of the meeting which usually starts, I don't know, around um, seven thirty. You know, you can even just come make a statement and leave but Seven o'clock. Shade tree is seven. Eight, eight o'clock is environmental. Environmental shade tree, seven. Environmental aid, first Thursday of every month. Yes. One last thing. I think it's like speaking to the choir here. All the people here know of the problems and things and so forth. And any type of communication, just as commercials do, you don't see them just once. It's mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Pretty soon it, it hits you, you know. So I think asking the uh, mayor and council, you can put in a little. Blur, and even if they say no, they may have another suggestion where you can do it or send it to another group mm -hmm. that, that doesn't usually participate in those things and anything that you can put in. People say, oh, even if you get one or two people, it's more than they had before. So the main is in there. I just want to, for anyone who needs to leave, and then for those of you who wish to stay, mm -hmm. um, we'll, uh, yeah. I'm not dismissing you. I just want to wrap it up for those who do need to leave. And I really want to thank all of these panelists for coming out. It's been a very busy day for everybody. As you know, some had to leave. Ryan had to come from another event and is going back to it. So we appreciate it. We appreciate the information. This is not a very large crowd, but we will have a television audience that will get to watch this over and over. And I have a request from the reporter, Jack, here. If any of you can send me a a summary or an outline or a copy of the presentation you did today. Jack said that he would like to get a copy of it and then he wants to put it all together and put it out as a, he does a net newspaper. It would go out there also. You mentioned that we are, the choir and I assume all of us here are very committed to trying to protect our environment and our trees. Yes, there are a few things you can do. For one thing, every year we have a tree giveaway. You can take some trees and plant them and encourage all of your friends and neighbors to do the same and tell them what you've learned. In addition to the fact that having a tree canopy increases the value of the property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just drive down Roseville toward the beach and look at that beautiful tree lined street mm -hmm. and compare it to any street in our town that doesn't have the tree lining. Where would you buy? if you were looking for a house right now. So you can do that. You can become involved if you would like. And um, if you'd like to attend our meetings, let me know. We'll certainly notify you when the next meeting happens. And if you'd like to participate in an event, our next event is going to be planting wildflowers to attract, I have to think for a minute, the pollinators. In the, well, one of these, I don't know them all, but yes, sir. We need to change. Oh, you're interrupting me. They go in the garbage here, and I'm bringing that home to compost it. Oh, um, that's my husband, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're going to be planting these over in the meadow that's right across from the library in the historic, it's right here on Deal Road. You all know where the grass is growing now. November 11th, it's a Saturday from 11 to 12. Bring a rake if you can come, and I was advised to warn you to dress for the tick protection, which scared me. I almost canceled the event. I don't want ticks on me either, but we'll dress accordingly. Bring one of those long handled rakes. We just scratch a little and drop some seeds in. If it rains, then we'll do it on November 12th, Sunday instead. So we welcome you. And again, spread the word to your friends. Bring a friend, plant some seeds, we got the bees. Um, if you'd like to show your support for the Water Act, the funding for infrastructure bill that I talked about, I have a petition here, and that will also get you opted into our email list. Oh, okay. great. If you haven't signed any of the forms over here, and I need everybody who's here to sign in, did anybody know?